and welcome to World Heritage Day 2022. My name is Tony Crouch, I'm the World Heritage Manager for the City of Bath and I have the pleasure of chairing today's event. Uh, we use the UNESCO World Heritage Day or close to it every year to celebrate that Bath is a World Heritage Site and to reach out predominantly to local audiences and explain the significance and importance of the site and really to use it as a learning and engagement opportunity. In the past, we've had up to 5,000 people on the Royal Crescent lawn in the sunshine with Roman reenactors charging across the grass and firing melons from trebuchets and things like that. And, and really that's where we would like to be. Uh, and this year we were this close to getting back to that, but these things are prepared in advance and we are online. But no matter, um, what it does enable us to do is to reach out a little further than local audiences this year, to go to some of our partners in the most exciting up and coming World Heritage Sites and, and, uh, and new sites, and to learn from their experience and to share ours. So it really does give us a unique opportunity. Before we go much further in this seminar, um, I, I want to just say something about Ukraine. Um, I think we should do. The founding principle of UNESCO is of course, building peace in the hearts of men and women through a shared understanding of our cultural heritage and indeed natural heritage. Uh, and it's important to express our support for those whose lives are currently being torn apart by war and indeed to condemn the aggression. So as of the 31st of March, our friends at the UK National Commission for UNESCO report that 53 cultural buildings, including historic monuments, places of worship, and libraries have been damaged or destroyed, including those in UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And it's likely, sadly, that this figure has risen significantly. Um, so it's important to use platforms such as the webinar today just to ensure that the Ukrainian people and their plight is not forgotten and to remind them that we stand firmly with them. OK, so back to happier times and, um, and things uh, today. We have an impressive line lineup of speakers. I'll share that with you at the moment. That the, the rules of engagement or parish notices are quite simple as such. It's, uh, it's a webinar, so the chat function um, is not on, but the question and answer function is. Please do ask questions if you want to, and they will appear in there, and we'll pick those out and put them to the speakers. The session is being recorded, but that shouldn't be of any problem to people because as a webinar, individual faces um, don't come up on the screen, so you, you won't be seen. We, we're very much hoping to have our youth ambassadors with us today. Um, it's a lottery funded project aimed at engaging young people in heritage work and providing them with accredited training. Um, and um, that we had sickness in the camp as recently as yesterday, so they're not um, gathered in person, but we do hope that they too may generate some questions. Right, I'm gonna to go to attempt to share screen now, the agenda today and um, you will know that, you are, that we have one joining link for the session and you're welcome to, to drop in and out and to join any sessions as you, should, um, as you should wish. Today is largely about interpretation. Um, World Heritage Sites are important not only for their physical fabric, of course, but for the stories that they tell. If you take the extreme examples of the Pyramids of Giza or Stonehenge, they're both beautifully arranged piles of rock, but the key significance perhaps in both of those is the, the reason the people behind them, building them, why they did it, and those stories. So it's a very big part of our jobs um, to, to tell those stories and to use that to convey the significance to as many people as possible. So what is our story here in Bath? Well, in terms of the existing ins inscription, uh, which was gained in 1987, it all starts, of course, with hot springs. The hot springs are the only ones to be classified as hot in the UK, but Bath is recognised as a cultural site, not a natural one. So it's not so much about the springs themselves, uh, but the cultural use of them for over 2000 years. They've been used for worship, healing, leisure and well-being and continue to be visited and interpreted at, um, by around 1.3 million people per year visiting the Roman bars. The Roman archaeology, of course, is not just any Roman um, archaeology, but the best example of a Romano British religious spa and some of the best preserved Roman remains north of the Alps. And in terms of the Georgian town planning, it's almost a complete survival of an entire Georgian city, demonstrating the adaptation of a classical Palladian style to an English setting. Uh, and the social setting is one of the 
areas that's more difficult to interpret perhaps and one of the ones that we struggle with a little bit but Bath played a pivotal role in the development of the polite society of the social customs and manners many of which remain with us today and which really have defined who we are as British people and all of this is set in a landscape setting in a city created to blend in and harmonize with the glorious natural surroundings and bringing the countryside into the very heart of the city. I think one of the lines from the statement of outstanding universal value for Bath, which always sticks with me, is that Bath was the deliberate creation of a beautiful city, very successfully so, and how many places can say that? So it truly is um, special in that regard. And of course, we are not only celebrating um, and describing one World Heritage inscription now. As of last year, we're describing two, uh, when Bath was successfully inscribed as part of the great spa towns of Europe. <clears throat> The picture you're looking at is the colonnade at Maliansky Lazny in the Czech Republic, which has become the poster boy, if you like, of the, of the great spas. And there are many, many glamorous pictures I'd like to share with you, but unfortunately, time does not permit a beauty um, parade. These are our partners. So we have um, 11 spa towns across seven countries in Europe, all part of one World Heritage Site, one transnational World Heritage Site. And what story do the great spas tell? Well, it's, it overlaps, of course, with our existing inscription. So it starts with, again, with the springs, really. Everything starts with the springs and the water. Although it's interesting to note that in some of our partner towns, the water is used differently um, to Bath. So for instance, in Spa in Belgium, they have really pure drinking water. And if you are lucky enough to um, have stayed in any of the leading hotels in the world, it's very likely that your tea was made from spa water because the tea is not only about the leaves, it's about the water and they export all around the world to people um, in top hotels. The continuing um, spa tradition uh, is very strong, especially in our European partners again. So in Bath, we mostly use the waters for wellness and leisure purposes these days, but there's still a strong health tradition in many of our European countries with sanatoria, still operating and in some cases still funded by the state in many of the other spas. The historic urban form and architecture is unique. The, the reason that towns, including Bath, grew up are very different to the normal reasons that, some reasons that towns um, are established. If you think of it, then towns are usually built up for reasons of trade, of commerce, of de um, defence, kingship, politics, etc. But Bath um, and the other spas really grew up as open air resorts uh, and they everything was provided in order to uh, meet the needs of the guests who flocked there. And you get unique architecture in that with pump rooms, bathhouses, colonnades, assembly rooms, walkways, hotels, villas and casinos all put on for the benefit of guests, which gives it a very different feel. The therapeutic and recreational spa landscape was also very much part of this cure. So you not only get the formal parks and gardens in the centre of the town, but the connected countryside deliberately provided beyond for people to walk into uh, and take exercise. And these places were the cafes of Europe. It wasn't only the fact that people flocked here in huge numbers before uh, mass tourism, as we know it, took off at the seasides. It was the people who came here. So in Europe and in the UK, the kings and queens quite literally came down from their castles and mixed with normal people in the streets, which happened almost nowhere else. And it attracted the cultural elite of society. So the picture at the bottom of the screen of the freeze in Spa shows the different people who um, flocked to the city or town through because it was a spa. And there's everybody's on that. Everybody from Tsar Peter the Great to um, the Duke of Wellington to Descartes um, to Victor Hugo, they're all there. And all these great people were literally rubbing shoulders in a town that's no bigger than modern day Midsummer Norton. Nowhere else did that happen apart from the grand metropolises of Europe. And even then they would have been segregated. So these places really were the melting pots of, um, of cultural innovation. And in summary, we're really talking about very, very distinctive places. The danger is that in our modern globally connected world of mass production, all places start to look the same. And if we lose these historic gems and their distinct character, we'll all be very much the poorer for it. So how do we tell these stories? Well, we've been greatly advanced our ability to do so with the 
um, opening of the World Heritage Centre and the Roman Bars Claw Learning Centre adjacent to it, which is due to all open um, very soon now, 9th of May. We have big thanks to um, all of our financial sponsors for that, mostly the um, National Lottery Heritage Fund who supported us all the way on that. And it gives us an ability to enthuse people about everything that we've got in Bath, tell them the story and spin them out to go and see it. So it's a massive step forward to that for us. The Claw Learning Centre and the New World Heritage Centre are part of a lot of projects that have happened in town, again, with the help of our National Lottery Heritage Fund friends. Um, there's been work at the Abbey, there's been work at Beckford's Tower, Cleveland Pools, Sydney Gardens, all during the, um, during the pandemic, and they've all been successfully delivered. But at this stage, I will stop talking and hand over to those who know far better than I about some of those projects. And we first go to Alice LePage, who's going to tell us about um, Cleveland Pools. Alice is the Learning and Engagement Trustee for the Cleveland Pools Trust. Um, <clears throat> she's a museum and heritage learning consultant. Uh, hugely impressive CV, public engagement positions at British Museum, Westminster Abbey, Pitt Rivers Museum, Orleans House Gallery in Hampshire Cultural Trust, amongst others. And she's going to focus today on um, the engagement of volunteers, which is something that that project has been really successful in doing. So, Alice, over to you. The virtual floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Tony. I'll um, just share my screen. I will start off by just doing a very, very quick uh, overview of what the Cleveland Pools is and our history, because that's not obviously not the focus of this particular talk. Um, but you can find out more from our website and um, have a look at our time lapse videos on our YouTube channel as well. So um, do check those out. Um, so the Cleveland Pools is Britain's oldest Lido. It was built in 1815 to pre protect the sensibilities of the Georgian male middle classes who had been swimming naked in the river. Um, or maybe it was to protect everyone else's sensibilities um, to give them a kind of more discreet space uh, to be able to go and swim. Um, it was river fed, uh, so it still had the, the natural feel, um, but was, was certainly a bit more um, hidden away. Uh, later, a small separate ladies pool was built and for the next 150 years or so it was enjoyed by the residents of Bath. Um, it closed to swimmers in the 1980s um, and although it enjoyed a short other life as a trout farm, it was permanently closed um, to swimmers after that until it was put up for sale by the council in 2003. At this point, um, a handful of local people led by Anne Dunlop, uh, Roger Horton and Janet Drysback, um, they uh, de developed the trust, created the trust and formed a campaign um, to save the pools and restore them for the community of Bath. Um, and over the next 11 years, they um, fundraised, they maintained the site and they lobbied to get the pools restored. And in 2014, the NLHF or the Heritage Lottery Fund, as they were at the time, granted the trust a development grant, which eventually led to a successful bid for £4.7 million um, in 2018 to start restoring the pools. Now, at this point, when the project began, um, the trust engage a small staff team and this currently stands and consists of a um, full-time project director and part-time community engagement and volunteer officer, a finance officer and a project administrator. So um, there were about 25 volunteers supporting the project at this point. Um, construction started on site last year in May and um, despite the complexity of the project, the site progress is really good. So we were hoping to be open this year. Um, but yeah, like I said, go and visit our, our um, web page for more information. So the focus of this talk is about our volunteers and how important they have been for the success of this project. Um, I would say that our programme started off as being very traditional. Um, you know, the volunteers were were involved, you know, doing gardening, as you can see, um, and, and kind of helping out on site. And it could very easily have continued that way. Um, obviously, there was the budget for a very small staff team to, uh, to de deliver the project, um, but, uh, and that included the volunteer and community engagement officer, but the trust was volunteer led. And naturally, at this point, there was a bit of resistance to the staff team who were coming in, you know, the volunteers, it had been their baby up until this point. So it wasn't appropriate for the staff to drastically change the way the trust existed. And to be frank, we would have lost an awful lot of volunteers if we had enforced this or if the staff had uh, enforced this. Um, thankfully, we 
employed uh, an incredible community engagement and um, volunteer officer, Sam, who had the right mindset and embraced those volunteers and ran with it really. So from the point that she was employed, Sam formalized the volunteer program. Um, she uh, held a skills audit, she developed role descriptions, the handbook, volunteer agreements, um, volunteer page on the website, program of socials, you know, everything that you would expect from a solid, well-run volunteer program. Um, and in line with the activity plan, she identified the areas that we needed to help with, um, but spoke to volunteers about what they were interested in doing. Um, the new volunteer program was built around the skills of those volunteers and the interests of them and her considered placement of that volunteer team. Now, importantly, as well, at this point, the trustees underwent a governance review uh, and it was realized that there was a skills gap around heritage and learning um, and in com community engagement. So uh, following this, recruitment started for the first trustee with a specific named remit focusing on this area um, that would support the community engagement of volunteer officer and that trustee is me. Um, so at the start of the NLHF project, National Lottery Heritage Fund project, um, the scope of what volunteers could be involved in expanded massively. Um, these projects always expect volunteer involvement, but really our volunteers play a bigger role than that. They are at the heart of our trust and it's their enthusiasm and commitment that has kept this project going. So in essence, we're a small startup organisation that had a huge programme to deliver and volunteers had to be a significant part of that. Um, we were excited. We were on the precipice and about to step into a whole new world for the pools and then COVID hit. <laughs> and uh, turned the world upside down, as we all know. Um, now, COVID has been catastrophic, really, for so many people, um, and it certainly made our project more complicated. You know, it was a complex project already. Um, so the impact of the pandemic with the lockdowns, um, considering the safety of our people, it really caused the trust to take a big step back and review how we worked and how we would progress with the delivery of this project. Um, in many ways, it change was kind of forced upon us um, due to COVID, but also because of the, the traditionally worked with volunteers just couldn't happen. No one was visiting site to do gardening anymore. Um, everything went online. And for our experienced coordinator who loves face-to-face -face community activities and for our volunteers, um, it was a steep learning curve, but uh, thankfully we were able to explore a number of opportunities to experiment with, to challenge our volunteer team and to be challenged back, um, and we eventually found our groove. So one thing we did benefit from uh, was the furloughing of skilled professionals, uh, people who were looking for activities that could fill some time um, when they were unable to work, uh, and by being flexible and responsive to their needs, we were able to find roles that suited their interests and skills, and to create um, a really valuable experience for them and us. And this is in no small part down to the skill of Sam to be able to identify where people might fit in with the project and organisation. Um, but also there was some organic growth of the programme. We were approached by people who wanted to, to help, um, wanted to offer their skills and experience. Um, and many of these have remained as volunteers if their schedules have allowed. Um, and so they all support, support the project in different ways, both virtually and in person. So now I wanted to share uh, a couple of examples of how our volunteers have been involved with the Trust's activities. Um, the first one is through one of our partnership projects. Um, the video I'm about to show you was created by young people um, from Mentoring Plus, who are, it's an organisation in Bath that supports young people who are facing challenges. Um, the film was created during the pandemic years and was inspired by memories of the pools from former swimmers. Hopefully it will play. <laughs>
Um, so not only was the project coordinated by a volunteer, uh, but volunteers invested in um, assisted with the site visit. They, uh, the heritage assets team who manage our um, photographs were um, were involved in the content development. The branding was developed by volunteers. Um, a team of volunteers completed the evaluation, so that's data collection, analysis, and the reporting. Um, and it was a collaborative, creative experience. And the autonomy of the volunteer team and um, for all has all that have been involved has seemingly strengthened our partnership. Um, we feel this really demonstrates the extent and benefit of volunteer involvement across the trust. And, uh, and has led us to explore more partnerships with residents across the city with volunteers co-creating projects um, from the outset. Um, so the next example is um, our uh, development of our on-site historical interpretation. So a volunteer team um, worked together to complete historical research, to explore stories from the pool's past, undertook training to create accessible text, um, presented their work to the wider volunteer team for feedback, um, as well as um, going out um, to uh, running a programme of community testing with care homes and schools to ensure the panels were both interesting and readable. Um, some of these volunteers have also used the knowledge that, and the skills gained um, to independently develop and coordinate the swimming, swimming costume exhibition that was held at the Holborn Museum in Bath in September last year. Uh, so it really just goes to show how beneficial this experience has been for so many people. Um, so as well as the roles that I've mentioned so far, um, volunteers are involved with our fundraising uh, recently, our cr successful crowdfunding campaign, um, our events like Heritage Open Days and our recent pop-up shop, um, learning and public engagement, so they're developing the schools programme and the creative films to support the interpretation, um, PR and comms, they do all our social media and our website, um, and of course, all of us trustees um, are involved in the governance too. So we're all in it for different reasons and we all bring different skills to the table, but we have come together to create a skilled and committed team of people who give sort of time to support this cause. Um, volunteers have always been at the heart of the pools and as time has gone on, obviously the roles have changed. Um, volunteering for the pools has moved in a different direction, but not necessarily in the way we expected. And now I'm very proud to say that we have a team of 130 volunteers. They have over the last year only um, uh, given us 4,900 hours of time. Um, and while it hasn't always been plain sailing, it has been for the better. We have been shortlisted um, for the Museums and Heritage Volunteers of the Year this year, and we'll find out in May whether we, um, the result of that. Uh, and we were the National Marshal Awards volunteer, um, National uh, for volunteering, the winners for the for the Marshal Awards. Um, and we are, you know, so many of our volunteers have found time with us so beneficial in so many ways, um, valuable for progressing their careers, developing new skills, building friendships, but also diversifying their interests. And for some of them, giving them focus during what could have been a very lonely and isolating time. Um, but also the trust and the delivery of the project has benefited massively um, from the skills and experience of the people that make up our volunteer community. And we share a great deal of, of respect for each other. So um, we are under no illusions that our, um, there is not more work to be done. Uh, we have improvements to make on our volunteer programme. Um, we continue with our good practice, consulting with our volunteers and um, recently completed a volunteer survey about their experiences or our experiences of volunteering. Um, and we know that we can do more to diversify our team, for example. 
Um, but now as we approach completion of the construction phase, um, we're looking forward to our next operational phase um, and our volunteer roles will change again. Um, we continue now to work as we have um, learned to, to reflect, to adapt and respond to the wants and needs of the volunteer team, as well as the uh, potential operators and the trust alongside the communities that we serve. Um, our volunteers provide invaluable insight into the wants and needs of one of our primary communities. So the pools has significant community support and it will soon reopen as a community pool. And we are so proud to say that our volunteers have been at the very heart of that. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Alice, um, very much for that. Loved the film. It was a little bit jerky, but it was very French noir. You wonder what was going to happen next and waiting for that <laughs> yeah. to come up at the end when um when it finished that that was that was great um, well you can see them all on our youtube channel so you can watch it again if it, if it wasn't perfect perfect thank you fingers big fingers crossed for me and um i i think the the most impressive thing that i took from that was that usually when you're running a project you look at volunteers and think what can they do for us but you're a shining example of flipping that telescope around and saying what can we do for them um and Absolutely. it's an equal, equal benefit and that's how you inevitably get the best out of people yeah um so well done and thank you um we if you can drop your screen down perfect and um, we will move on to um amy i think we'll take questions at the end because um then we can play with whatever time we've got available so amy will be well known to to um most people locally dr amy frost is the architectural historian at bath preservation trust and their senior curator of the trust's four museums um, she's a renowned expert on all things Bath that wouldn't fit into half an hour, and she's fresh back from celebrating success in Southwest Tourism Awards, I hear, um, which is brilliant news. Uh, interpretation is not always about telling happy stories, and Amy's going to introduce us to Beckford's Tower, where I think it's safe to say the story is somewhat complex, Amy. Yes, thanks, Tony. I'll just share my screen. Uh, Beckford's Tower is one of the four museums that Bath Preservation Trust operates in Bath and sits alongside Number One Royal Crescent, the Herschel Museum of Astronomy and the Museum of Bath Architecture. Um, and that also runs in parallel with um, the advocacy and campaigning work that Bath Preservation Trust does on the built heritage and natural environment of the city. Um, but I'm going to talk about, about a project that we are working on um, at Beckford's Tower. Um, so Beckford Tower is a grade one listed building. It was built in 1826 to 27, and it is set within a grade two registered park and garden, which is Lansdowne Cemetery. And it was once the summit of a mile long designed landscape that went from Lansdowne Crescent in Bath up to the tower, which was created by the Bath architect Henry Edmund Goodridge um, for and in collaboration with William Beckford, a leading British writer and collector and whose wealth was generated by his ownership of plantations and enslaved Africans in Jamaica. Of significance um, of the, is the role the tower played in introducing the mature picturesque architectural style um, into Bath and the sort of transition from the Palladianism architecture into neoclassicism and the introduction of the, the urban villa within the city. Um, and these, this links the tower very closely to the attributes of the, the City of Bath World Heritage Site OEV, the Georgian Town Planning, um, the Georgian architecture, but also the green setting of the city. Um, the location of the tower within the setting of the World Heritage Site means that it's a key building in the assessment of the character of that setting. Um, and views and vistas to and from the tower um, are really fundamental to the understanding of the setting of, of the Bath World Heritage Site and also really illustrative of this really incredible relationship that the city has between the built environment and the natural environment. Um, the tower is a challenging building to maintain as you might see from this image um, which is a stunning image but um, if it were pouring with rain, you'd be seeing something very different. Um, so it's a challenging building to maintain, but Beckford's story is an equally challenging one to interpret. 
We highly value the significance of the building, of the landscape, of the collection that he created, and the important influence that it had upon the development of British art and design. But we must always understand and communicate the source of the wealth that paid for it. And that really sits at the heart of the project that we are working on at the moment. So we are in the development phase of a National Lottery Heritage Fund supported project to conserve the tower, open up access to new heritage, both within the building and within the landscape, and create a new visitor experience that really integrates the building and the landscape and makes it accessible for everyone. So interpreting the story, the site, the landscape, both before the pay barrier of entering the museum and then within, uh, within the museum itself. It's been a project of quite long evolution. So we have been developing the project for 10 years um, and have used that time to really um, strategically survey and assess the impact of weather on the, the, on the fabric of the building. Um, and in particular, assess the extreme weather events that climate emergency has undoubtedly resulted in and the impact that that is having on the building. But another big catalyst for us for this project is what you can see to the left hand side of the tower in this image. And that is a new community that has been built and developed um, on the site of a former Ministry of Defence site. So for the first time ever, we have neighbours um, and we have neighbours who we want to engage, involve, um, but also who in a very short space of time have, have said, have shown that they also want to be involved with essentially what is an extension of their back garden over the road. Um, and this is, was a really exciting opportunity for us um, and is a, a, a central part of the project. Um, that we have created. Um, and another opportunity that, that came along at the same time is what you can see on the right hand side of the tower in this image. Um, so what you can see is uh, Lansdowne Cemetery. So what was once Beckford's Pleasure Garden um, became Lansdowne Cemetery in 1848. And just beyond it, beyond it some open fields. Um, the paddocks at the end of the cemetery, um, which you can see in the upper left hand image um, on your screens. Um, and we were able to acquire these two empty paddocks or open paddocks um, early in, in um, 2020, thanks to the generosity of a, a extreme generosity of a private individual. And for us, acquiring these paddocks were really important. Um, uh, they prevented them or the risk of them falling into um, further private ownership and the risk of, of development to commercial development on that site on what is a, a key green space within the setting um, of the city. But it also gave us space. It gave us green space. Um, and something that we knew was going to be important for our project, but we didn't quite realise how important until we actually got permission to start our project and embarked on it in February 2020. Um, so this is the development phase of our project. And obviously, as, as, Alex has, uh, as Alice has said, um, this was a catastrophic moment in, in March of that year. Um, for heritage sites and organisations. And what we soon noticed as, as we stripped down to the bare minimum of, of our staff across our organisation um, was the amount of people that were walking in the landscape um, ar around the tower, surrounding the tower, and suddenly how important to us having these green paddocks became. Um, uh, in terms of access to open space. What purchasing the paddocks also made possible for us is the rather muddy hole that you can see in the image um, on the bottom left of your screen. And that is access to um, and the kind of rediscovery of um, a, a lost piece of heritage um, within this area of Bath and that is the Grotto Tunnel that William Beckford built um, within his landscape. Um, 
by owning the paddocks, we can now open up this tunnel um, and restore it and, and open it to um, public access, but also list it. So um, nominate it for heritage protection for, for its ongoing conservation um, management. Um, we've actually filled it back in again because we've done exploratory work in this development phase. And if, then if we're successful in, in securing the, the full grant in the next phase, um, we will be undertaking all of that opening up work um, alongside key conservation work, which is what you can see on the right hand side of your screen um, to address really fundamental issues with the increasing volume of rainfall. And it's not that we're getting more rain across a year, it's that we're getting more very, very heavy, very, very noticeable short periods of intense rain um, through climate emergency that this historic building was just not designed to get rid of. So the project is really addressing that, that um, these um, built fabric um, conservation um, elements. But at its heart of it as well is the interpretation of the site, of the landscape, of the tower and of Beckford, the man. So um, a, a quick kind of overview of, of Beckford for those that, that may not have, have heard of him before. Um, William Beckford was born in 1760 and at the age of 10, um, his father died leaving Beckford as the head of what at that time was one of the most powerful political families in London um, and one of the most influential um, families in British colonialism. Since 1661, the Beckfords had owned plantations on Jamaica, so had claimed in ownership enslaved Africans. And when Beckford inherits, he inherits a, a vast fortune um, and claims in ownership over three and a half thousand enslaved people on Jamaica. He uses that wealth to uh, pursue architectural ambitions, um, build uh, first a house in Wilkshire and then the, the tower as you've seen in Bath, uh, but also to amass a world famous collection, some of the images of which you can see on the right. Um, and a collection that, that continues to um, hold a, a pivotal role um, within our understanding of, of European decorative arts. All of this made possible through the profits of transatlantic slavery. And that uh, uh, is at the core of, of the work that, that we are doing. Um, alongside, um, Beckford was also exiled for 10 years because of his relationship with William Courtney, the future Earl of Devon at Powderham Castle uh, near Exeter. And the exposure of his relationship forced Beckford to leave the country, um, where after a short period, his wife died and he spends 10 years in exile in Europe before returning um, to England and subsequently then um, coming to Bath to build this retreat, a place where he could withdraw from society. Um, he could uh, be surrounded by his collection and he could sit within a landscape um, things that, that gave someone who was increasingly isolated in his life uh, great comfort. So it is a complex story and it is a story of transatlantic slavery, it is a pivotal story to queer history, um, it is a story of isolation and loneliness. Um, and all of things, these things that we wanted to explore um, when we suddenly went into lockdown. And um, much like Alice is, is brilliantly shown um, with Cleveland Pools, we had to very quickly adapt our project, um, a project that we really wanted to, to base on um, a lot of consultation. And the core to this project is that we are not telling Beckford's story through a single voice. It's not through my voice as the curator, it's, it's not through a single voice, it is through multiple voices. And to do that, we embarked on a period of consultation, which amazingly, um, we were able to do even through lockdown. So we put together a community advisory group. Um, we met uh, on Zoom. 
Um, and then the minute we could have um, a people meeting outside, we took advantage of those paddock spaces to do outdoor consultation sessions, which is what you can see on the, the image on your screen. And this consultation has been um, inspirational. And the trust that the participants in our community advisory group who are representing communities within the city, um, families, uh, primary schools, um, a Bath's black community, Bath's elderly community, um, the trust they have placed in us to feel safe enough to talk very, very openly and honestly about the issues that we're discussing and how we should think about communicating them and interpreting them has been um, really humbling and it has been really, really inspiring and through a lot of our consultation um, through both that that advisory group but also um, more partners and the groups that they represent um, we have been uh, gathering information we have been testing ideas all of it informing the development of our project um, and you can just see on your screen some of the feedback that that was from one particular workshop and we went into this project in particular and those first months of, of lockdown kind of showing us the amount of people that were using the landscape, talking a lot about the, the access to that open space, the access to that green setting of the World Heritage Site, site being so um, beneficial to um, well-being and to people being able to, at a time when all you could do was go outside, um, uh, uh, in order to at first on your own and then to be able to meet people that the, the importance of that we were going in under an understanding that this was going to be key to, to well-being and health and and of course participants and some of our community advisors stand in that space and say this isn't comfortable this isn't a space that is good for my well-being this is a space, this is a site where I am confronted with British colonialism. I am confronted with historic racism and the causes of racism today. And that has been really powerful and that has been very influential on our project. And they're um, following up those sort of statements with, but we want to help you. We want to, we want to make this space a space um, that everyone it, it, it feels welcome and that is inclusive and help you tell this challenging story. So through a lot of this consultation, through the partnership working that we've been doing, um, all through the, the pandemic, all through lockdown, um, we were able to then uh, come up with an interpretation strategy based on um, a key idea and that is about taking in the view from all perspectives. It is understanding and interpreting all of the stories um, that surround Beckford, that surround the site, that surround the landscape, and that surround the relationship of this site with the, the wider World Heritage Site um, through multiple voices um, and basing those stories on really rigorous fact and research and taking those research uh, taking the information and placing them in the hands of some of our, our community groups and seeing where they go with them and seeing how it inspires, informs, angers, um, provokes uh, responses and, and then using those responses and in including it in our interpretation. So we, we, have, we have come up with five themes, um, all of which interlink, all of which um, are wider and, and more specific. Um, we're looking at Beckford the Man, um, looking at the Beckfords and their uh, complicity in transatlantic slavery, um, looking at queer history, um, looking at design and nature, and looking at ideas of well being and isolation. And these are informing um, the development um, of our project. And a lot of that consultation has also been really reinforced by our involvement with the Bath and Colonialism Action Group um, and the, the wealth of knowledge and expertise and um, uh, just inspiration that, that is coming from that, that group as well, um, informing uh, an ambition to look at a, a more inclusive history um, of the city and the people um, who uh, historically have been significant to it. 
So where we are at the moment um, is we are due to submit our um, National Her uh, Lottery Heritage Fund application um, on the 26th of May. Um, so we are getting very close to um, um, submitting that application um, and then hearing um, about the results of that in the autumn this year. And if successful, um, we will be undertaking all the works for this project in 2023 to then reopen in 2024. Um, and one of the things the pandemic really prevented happening um, was us being able to um, test ideas with visitors coming into the tower at weekends because the tower obviously closed in March 2020 um, and um, we were at one point not looking to be able to reopen um, until um, we knew whether the, the project would be undertaken. But thankfully, with the, the, the amazing support and generosity um, of the NLHF, um, we are actually able to um, fund an interim period between submission of our application um, and uh, finding out um, because of the impacts of the pandemic. So we are able to open the museum this year so that we can test interpretation and we're testing those themes, we're testing those stories um, so that we can continue to work with partners and community groups and workshops and continue to gather this information to inform the detailed um, uh, project and the detailed design of the project um, should we be successful in securing it. So um, watch this space. Um, we, we have lots going on. And if you've never visited the tower, um, please do come and visit at weekends. We're open on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, and please fill in the survey um, and answer any questions that our staff have. Um, have because like Alice said, um, uh, evaluation of, of the things that, that we are doing are so important. Um, to helping us um, uh, improve, get better, and to make sure that that core idea of being able to um, listen to multiple voices and to tell this story through multiple, multiple voices um, really um, uh, becomes a success. Great, thanks, Amy. That um, is a really interesting approach and very good about telling the story through multiple voices, multiple approaches. We live in an age where everything, every subject has a radio phone in and we're used to hearing different views on it. But in traditional heritage terms, we usually hear an organisational, agreed organisational view from the owner of the building, be that a trust or whatever, on it. But to tell a story from very pe different people's viewpoints and to acknowledge that some people feel very differently, maybe feel uncomfortable about being in a building, whereas other people think it's splendid, is a really... Um, I think innovative approach and, um, and, and one which you've dem demonstrated well and that, that's obviously working well for you. Yeah, yeah and, and just um, we're spending a lot of time listening and I think that's really really important is, is that, that you're listening to people um, and trying to um, uh, sometimes change your ideas but, but also change the way you do things off the back of that. Yeah. We've got a question. Robert Piper has asked about the um, the name um, of Beckford's Tower. Obviously, you've had in depth discussions about this. What's what's the thinking? We have, um, and and it's something that we've also talked to our um, advisors, our community advisors about, um, and uh, also some of our, our sort of we have a, an academic uh, advisory group um, who are also um, ensuring that we're being very rigorous and, and that we're doing things with with uh, great integrity and on that group is Professor Robert Beckford, um, a, a black historian and theologian um, and we've worked with him for quite a long time and um, discussions around that name and what that name means is, is central to, to our interpretation um, and what that means in terms of um, identity and power and um, that name being enforced upon people who have been stripped of their identities. Um, so enslaved Africans on Beckford plantations being forced to take the, the Beckford name um, and the, the, the subsequent um, history of that. Um, and working with Robert and his family um, and hopefully uh, if successful extending that out in our a delivery phase to uh, working with more um, black British people with the surname Beckford to really 
really interrogate um, what that name is and, and what that, that means. Um, and what that means to us, what that means to them, what that means to, to our visitors um, is, something, is something that's really kind of core cool to, to the work we're doing. Um, change the name of the tower no it's been it's it's been interesting um some of the responses that we've been having from 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 those people you know people that are really affected um by by that name um in terms of it it being uh interestingly people that have sort of changed their name and those that haven't and why they haven't um and using it as the it's sort of the tool that breaks open that story from the very, very beginning. Um, and um, so it's, it's, we're not intending to change it, um, but we are continuing to consult around it. Um, and if that consultation starts to sort of change direction, then it's, you know, it's something that we'll, con we'll continue to always be um, um, research, understanding and, and listening and considering. Um, and that's sort of tied up also with, you know, responses to other Beckford related uh, pieces of heritage. So the statue of Alderman William Beckford that's in the Guildhall in London um, 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 and, and, and other sort of pieces of heritage related to Beckford. Mm. Interesting. Thank you. Alice, are you still there? I presume you are. We, we can't see you at the moment. Yeah, uh, just... Um, Coming back to you on a, on the question of volunteers, the Cleveland Pools has, has had a very slow gestation. Uh, it's, it's a long haul nearly there. Um, how do you keep volunteers engaged over that length of period? Have you found that you have a churn in volunteers or the same ones with you, or is it a bit of both? Do you have how do you keep it fresh? Yeah, it's a bit of both, to be honest. Um, some of some of our volunteers have been involved, like I say, Anne Dunlop, who, who was one of the first to, you know, to start the campaign. She is still on our trustee board as our founder, one of our founder trustees and same with Roger. Um, and, you know, people, people really, really have engaged with the pools. You know, they're a lot of people are so, so keen for this to be reopened, um, see it as such a beneficial asset to the community of Bath um that you know they've invested huge huge amounts of their time over the years to to be um involved and yes there are some volunteers who who you know participate and and, and join us for a short period of time it all depends on their you know what's happening in their lives um you know and, and what they what they want from their volunteering experience um but certainly we do have you know, a, a core team who have been involved for many years um, and, uh, and, you know, just can't wait to see it reopened. Um, but yeah, I think, I think, like I said in, in the presentation, the fact that, you know, how things are evolving with the project, you know, how we're moving from, you know, the campaigning phase to now the restoration and then, you know, the project's constantly changing um, and the needs that we have as a trust change um, and obviously people's people's needs change as well in terms of what they want them from their volunteering um, and I think because we're able to be responsive to their needs um, it helps to 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 keep them involved um, you know depending on what what they need from us as well okay brilliant thank you got a couple of questions from Mark Watson about UNESCO um, which, which I'll take and um, Mark asks about the plans to hold the uh, UNESCO World Heritage Conference in Russia this year under Russian um, chairmanship. Um, the, the issue of the conference has been firmly addressed because the UK alongside, it was 45 originally, but maybe many more now, countries have said that they, they will not attend or participate in the country being in, in a committee being hosted in Russia. The um, so UK and, and Bath and North East Somerset Council are firmly behind that stance, so that is very clear. As for the Russian presidency of UNESCO, it's that's more of a political matter. I have my own views on that, but um, um, I'm sure everybody else does too. But that's one for UNESCO to work out through their extremely bureaucratic um, measures that they, ha they have in place and more difficult for them. It, um, sadly, I'm sure this won't be the last world conflict and, and, and what do we do about that? But that's a, largely a matter for UNESCO. Um, 
the Mark has also asked about why the Great Spa's inscription was not tied up with our existing inscription, so we didn't have just one um, covering both aspects and, and it would stop or help address the multitude or the overbalance of European World Heritage Sites. There's two reasons for that really. I mean, the, the Great Spa's inscription obviously happened much later than our existing. Um, it was instigated and is run by the Czech government. Um, so we, are, we joined the party, if you like, and you cannot tell the story of leading spas in Europe without the inclusion of Bath. So we're very much part of that story, quite rightfully so. Uh, and that's the way that it organically grew to include Bath within, within that group. Uh, and thus it become an, it became an overlay of our existing World Heritage status. But there's a second element to it too, in that because the 11 World Heritage Sites in the Great Spa Towns of Europe are technically one World Heritage Site, if something calamitous should happen in Karlovivari, for example, or Baden-Baden, and the, um, those should get struck off the World Heritage List in a Liverpool style, the whole series falls. So um, all 11 towns are, um, are then struck off the list. Uh, and for Bath, it's uh, a little bit of a safety valve that we have the separation between the two inscriptions, because we, I don't think we'd have gone into the Great Spas project if there was a risk to our existing World Heritage status. We have no control over development matters in other countries legally and things. So um, it works for us that there is a degree of separation um, between those two inscriptions. I hope that's clear. Um, it's, it's sort of a, it, some, some respects about how it is, um, but in other ways it works for us. Please do use the, um, the, the Q&A um, thing uh, through, the, uh, through the rest of the day. I'm just checking there's nothing else up there. I don't think there is to, to address, um, but we've made a, an excellent start to the day. We're bang on time, which is, um, is brilliant. So I'd like to thank um, our two speakers today for, for brilliant presentations and for showcasing some leading practice in Bath. Best of luck to both of you for the May submissions and, and subsequent results. And, and um, special thanks to Amy, who I now understand is off to on holiday to Cornwall, no doubt very well earned. <laughs> but um, that concludes the, the first session today. Um, and please do join us again. You're gonna, there's a break now for a cup of tea and then we're back at 11.30 for an introduction to the flow country, which is the potentially the next UK World Heritage um, inscription. And it's a really interesting site. It's like nothing else that we've got on the list at the moment. So please do join us for that. Thanks for joining us so far, but we'll see you um, in a little while. Many thanks. Welcome back everybody. It's just about half past now, so we will start our second session. Uh, and good morning to those who are just joining from specifically for, for this session. My name is Tony Crouch. I'm World Heritage Manager of the City of Bath and I have the pleasure of um, being your chair for today. Earlier on, we heard about Bath and about interpretation methods and involvement of, um, of the community. And that's in a city very vibrant city with around 88,000 people in it, 5,000 listed buildings, lots of um, interest and lots of community to, to work with. We're now going somewhere completely different. We're going to the, the north of Scotland um, with a much lower community numbers, hardly any buildings I suspect, and a very different kettle of fish in terms of interaction and in terms of interpretation. Dr. Stephen Andrews is, is with us to talk about this. Uh, Stephen's a geologist and is the project coordinator for the Flow Country in Scotland, uh, which is set to be the UK's next World Heritage Site. So this is a very cutting edge project in many respects. It's very different to anything that's on the uh, UK World Heritage List at the moment. And in terms of interpretation, as we just outlined, it's a really interesting challenge. Um, I'm sure that Stephen won't be offended if we say that on a cold, wet day, a peat bog is not necessarily the thing of beauty that um, and, and might be something that needs explaining, but I could be completely wrong. Stephen, Stephen, over to you. Thanks for that, uh, Tony. Yes, hopefully, hopefully I can challenge that that point a little bit um, as, I, as I introduce the <laughs> as I introduce the site. As Tony said, now for something completely different. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk to you about a region, as, as was correctly pointed out, that has very few buildings in it. And in fact, as we've drawn the boundary or proposed boundary, 
uh, has very few people in it also but that's not to say it's not hugely important for people to understand and to to you know fulfilling i suppose the world heritage goal of of kind of dissemination um of of a really important site so i'm gonna alongside just giving a broad introduction to well, what is the flow country um i'm also going to talk a little bit about its importance fighting climate change because that seems something which is pretty um high on the agenda currently so just to give an outline as i said i mean really want to start off by a bit of a, a where what and why and in fact that's going to take up the majority of the time that i'm going to speak to you for and then talk a bit about climate change and also um kind of threats to the to the site and, and mitigation that, that's ongoing so obviously you guys are well I don't, I, as was pointed out are, are probably a largely local audience to the south and we've gone nearly as far north as we can certainly in mainland uh, uk and the, the flow country stretches across um the historic counties of, of caithness and sutherland um in the, in the very far north of scotland so just zooming into that little red um bean uh, a bit more closely what what does that area look like well it's um it's big uh, I think is is a good way of describing it. Ninety kilometres across doesn't do the infrastructure justice because as much as it's ninety kilometres across, it'd take you two and a half hours to to traverse um, that by car, mainly because there's very few roads to go across it. Um, the wider flow country region is around four hundred thousand um, hectares, so really significant in its scale. And you can see from this um, image that it, that it varies significantly across um, the region as well. We've got very mountainous. Um, areas in the west and then as you move to the the northeast it becomes you can see that that kind of green color typical of of cultivation um so it's so much more agricultural land out there but pretty wild in between in terms of the getting into kind of the nitty-gritty of of the actual boundary well as with all um certainly with all natural sites one of the big aims is to try and make sure the site has um integrity and that is uh, achieved through through the through the site being uh, effectively as large as possible and, and having as few holes in it if that kind of makes sense so we've effectively drawn the the proposed boundary around the best bits of blanket bog um, and also those areas that uh, aid in the function of, of blanket bog now that doesn't make a lot of sense when you don't understand what a blanket bog is but i'm going to come on to that uh, um, shortly but what you can see is um the, the the gaps that do exist are these north south lines which are effectively the, the straths so they're the, the valleys that run um through the area and they're dominated by kind of agricultural land as opposed to the blanket bog um it's often an interesting point that you know we kind of think of bogs sitting in low areas well, we've got to reverse that thinking when it comes to blanket bogs and again i'll come on to that in a moment and that really falls under the question well what on earth is the flow country i've mentioned bog a lot so far but um not all bogs are the same um in fact there's, there's quite a few different types of bogs and and the type that the flow country represents is very specific and actually globally um really rather rare so going back to some of the really early research on, on peatlands and bogs, um, Oswald produced a, a classification back in 1925 where he, he defined four different types of bog, um, the forest bog, uh, raised bog, a flat bog, and then what he termed a terrain bedecadens moor, which I just think is a fantastic uh, term, but essentially means blanket bog, um, the terrain being bedecked um, by, by, this, by this feature. So in terms of why have we got these different types of bog? Well, as I mentioned, there are there are different kind of ways in which bog can form. And I suppose the one that probably we think about most if we're not in an area dominated by blanket bog is where you just get water ponding and therefore the development of all the different plants and species which build up that peat. Um, in the north of Scotland, and in fact, across parts of England and Wales as well, there's another type of bog we see, and we kind of almost take for granted, particularly if you live in the middle of it, as I do. Um, and that's this blanket bog. And it receives, or it forms due to the receipt of, of con consistent enough rainfall that effectively you end up with a, a waterlogged uh, land surface um, 
throughout the year. And that allows bog to form on slopes, which is kind of odd, um, and, and, and blanket the whole, uh, the whole region. But it's not just as simple as, as, as a single blanket. In fact, it's lots of different kind of what you might term kind of hydrological units. I was thinking that there's quite a lot of parallels with kind of glaciers and the way they form in terms of accumulation of snow in a place. And then, you know, some areas kind of flow a little bit and they, they, they have different kind of elements. But there are very much limits to that, um, that analogy. But I think this diagram kind of hopes, hopefully highlights that although you have a blanket across a whole region, there are different components to that which come up against each other. And, and maybe the best thing to do is, in fact, um, kind of actually have a look at what this landscape looks like, and then maybe you can start to see how you can identify these different hydrological elements. So this is a view looking broadly um, south east um, from kind of the center of the, the, the flow country. And we can see this incredible range of different pool systems. And these can be really useful in helping us understand how these different elements of, of the peatlands um, interlink. So in the very front of this image, what we can see is, a, is kind of a, almost a circular pattern of pools, some with water and some without water in them. I've just highlighted that there um, with this yellow kind of circle. And what this is is a watershed mire. So it's actually sitting right on top of a hill. In fact, a, a bit of a, an offshoot of, of the main hill of, of Knockfin Heights. And so the, the ground is dipping away in all directions and the pools are, are forming in concentric um, circles. So interestingly, the pools, I mean, as you'll see from the OS map here, the pools are dominating the high ground. So they're on top of the hills, not in the hollows. And that's a really strong indication that we've got that kind of consistent rain fed uh, water logging of, the, of the, the land surface. There's another shot looking west, um, again, from a similar point, but, but turning around and just looking in a different direction. And again, we see this intricate sets of pool systems running down towards a river valley and running through the center of the, of the, of the, of the image there. And again, if I put on some interpretation and we can kind of put on the OS map as well, so as you can see how they relate to the topography and we can see this brown element sits on a, on a spur. So a, a little um, projection coming out from the main hill. I mean, we can see the kind of the, the arcuate pattern of, of pools that, that are associated with that. We can see then other elements where you have valley side mires. So where the, the peatland are, is developing just on, on the side of the valley and then running down towards where the, where the stream um, intersects. And then we have this, this green area saddle mire. So that's actually sitting between what would be a, a watershed mire and then these other elements. And they, they all effectively link together. And you, get the, you do get some kind of interesting features between where the, these different hydrological elements sit, such as ladder fens um, and so on. But I'm not going to go into that in, in any more detail. Because what you can start to do, and I think this, the diagram on the left here kind of indicates quite nicely how these different hydrological elements sit and have boundaries between. But when you actually start looking a bit closer, then what you start to see is, is, a, is, a, is a more detailed level of kind of division of these different kind of elements. And we have high hummocks and low hummocks and pool systems. And it, I, I'm not, not going to go into the detail here, but what it leads to is a really intricate um, landscape. And that varies significantly across the, across the flow country as well, due to a number of different factors that I'll come on to a bit later. So this is just a general view. And interestingly, this is on a wet day. Um, as Tony pointed out, maybe not the most attractive. But actually, when you get out into this landscape, the colours on a wet day can actually be almost more intense. Um, in, in fact, sphagnums are very, very clever. So sphagnum moss is one of the major... Um, a species that we find across the flow country. And what it does when it dries out is it bleaches to try and reflect the sunshine so as it can maintain as much water as possible. So of course, then when it um, has water, it intensifies its color also. So we've got a really nice um, patch of red down in the, on, on the right-hand side of this image, it's uh, sphagnum capillifolium. And then we've got these, these really large hummocks as well of um, rachimitrium, so a slightly different kind of moss, uh, woolly fringe moss as well as then this, this really brightly white um, reindeer lichen, which, which is often uh, found across the, the area as well. We also see cotton grass sticking up, nice little kind of white um, balls of that on, on top of these uh, stems just blowing in the wind. So 
even on a wet day, I like to think it's it, it is quite an attractive landscape. Um, but yeah, it's one of these landscapes you need to actually get into and look at and and, and let it draw you in um, to to really fully appreciate it. And then, I mean, if if it needed any more uh, emphasis, hopefully these shots really show um, just how incredible the the sphagnum mosses can be. There's over 30 different species of sphagnum moss can be found in the in the flow country each of them with slightly different forms some with longer kind of fronds and uh, and different styles of capitula that's the, the head of the um of each sphagnum and then they, they often intergrow as can be seen on this this right hand image and also in there we've got things like sundew which are these carnivorous uh, plants uh, doing a great job in and well, I say a great job. They get rid of some of the midges, but not of all of them. I'd suggest if you do want to visit the flow country, this time of year is excellent because the midges haven't quite come out yet. I should also say that by containing 30 different types of, of, of 30 different species of sphagnum moss, it's around 10% uh, of the, the global um, population of sphagnum um, can be found in the flow country. And of course, I'm not going to go into the, the whole hierarchy of the ecosystem, but it also contains a, a fantastic um, biodiversity, which is interesting because bogs aren't noted for their biodiversity. But if you wanted the best biodiversity you could find in any bog, the flow country is where you'd go to. And part of that are the bird populations that it, that it contains. Due to the lack of small mammals um, within the, the flow country, there's a there's a distinct um, paucity of, of predators to the birds. And so it allows a lot of ground nesting um, species to, to flourish. And here we've got uh, the lovely golden plover, which has the most beautiful call, kind of haunting call early at this time of year um, as you walk out across the, across the flows. It, it also benefits from being a particular latitudinal position that, that that means we have a, a a crossover of kind of arctic species as well as more continental species so we see a, a mixture of uh, of bird species within the flow country that you would struggle to see anywhere else in the world so it's really rather special and um, from that perspective also so in terms of well why is it there um as i've already kind of touched on it's it's really important that it's wet so wet being a good thing, um, which I know for a lot of people isn't considered the case. Um, but it doesn't just need to be wet. It needs to be consistently wet. It needs to have um, an average rainfall each month, which keeps everything kind of nicely waterlogged. And the north of Scotland does this does this really nicely. It also needs to be cool, but not too cool. So we're very much in a, in a Goldilocks kind of setting here. And the, the north of Scotland, again, I mean, just pointing out to the, the far north here, you can see it just has these, these nice kind of average kind of temperatures of, of 10 to 11 degrees um, that's the the mean maximum temperature um, and then rainfalls of between yeah about a thousand to 1250 millimeters on it from a global perspective those conditions are not found widespread so we've got a band in the north um, which we can see with these kind of cross hatches highlighted and a band in the south and this means that this this habitat is actually incredibly rare. And it, it's one of these things I find quite difficult to, to kind of give its credence because I've, I haven't grown up in the area. I'm just used to it being like this. And it, but it's funny when you go elsewhere in the world and you look around, you go, no, we don't, this, this doesn't exist elsewhere. And so it's, it's, it's really, really important. The other interesting thing with the flow country is that it's really diverse in terms of its ge geology and, and the topography that, that kind of interlinks with the, with the, um, with the geology. So as we move from east to west, we end up with what we term hard rocks moving towards soft rocks. We've got a change in, in the chemistry of those rocks. And that leads to, to a change in the substrate on which the, the, the bog is, is growing. On top of that, we have a, a significant change in topography, the, the reds here being kind of high and, and the blues being low. And we see a change from really mountainous um, topography to really kind of um, into more rolling topography. And of course, coming back to the climate, that influences um, also with, with wetter conditions in the west and, and drier in the east. Interestingly, there's an interplay here between the, the kind of topography and the, and the rainfall, because as much as we have increased rainfall in the west, it moves through the landscape quicker because it's steeper. Um, so you actually get relatively lower um, accumulation rates of peat. 
as you move to the east, despite it being drier, it's more rolling and therefore the water stays for longer in the landscape and therefore the peat accumulates um, at a faster rate. So we actually have our thickest peat developments of up to around 10 metres um, in, the, in the east of the region. So that's hopefully given you a background of why, uh, well, where, where the flow country is, what it is and, and, and why it's formed. But just to go back into kind of world heritage mode for a moment, I think it's worthwhile to just go, well, okay, so what is it we're, we're nominating this for? And it, it really falls under two criteria. That's uh, criteria nine and 10. Uh, the first of those is to summarize ongoing ecological uh, and biological processes. And the second one is the, is the, is the biodiversity. So the significant natural habitats for in situ conservation of, of biological diversity. But we can break those down a little bit further. Um, so we can think of um, the biological diversity as, 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 as uh, sorry, the, the ongoing ecological um, processes as the formation of blanket bog. And so this is a bog which forms over slopes and dips in the landscape, which is what makes it particular. I've also highlighted that, it, that it's got great diversity across it. And this is caused by the climatic, topographic and, and geographic gradients. And therefore you get a really big change in the nature of the bog as you go across. I should also point out it's been forming for the last 10,000 years, and therefore we've got this kind of fourth dimension. So we can think about going back in time and reading the history of, of the formation of this, of this feature. And to that end, it forms a fantastic natural laboratory. This is a, this is a, a, a site that researchers visit from all over the world to come and see the, the kind of type site for, for blanket bog. And there's a huge amount of research ongoing into the region, uh, coordinated by the University of Highlands and Islands. In terms of other processes that are ongoing, and this is where we start to move into the, the importance of climate change, um, blanket bogs are hugely important for carbon sequestration and storage. And this is effectively because the plants grow, they die, but they don't fully decompose. And it's that, um, you know, effectively when a plant decomposes, it releases its carbon. When it doesn't decompose and it just gets stored as peat, it locks that down. And so it's quite different to how we might think of other um, carbon sequesters, such as forestry. Well, I'll come on to that in a bit more detail in a moment. It also forms a really important role for water quality, and it's keeping the riverine habitats that drain from the flow country incredibly healthy. So where we've seen elsewhere globally a decline in Atlantic salmon populations, uh, the rivers that flow from the flow country have actually maintained really, um, really high, high, high populations of, of salmon. There are also important populations of freshwater pearl mussel um, throughout the region and European eel, which are also um, endangered. Then the, the, the second uh, criteria, criteria uh, 10, is around the biodiversity, as I mentioned, and this is all to do with basically the species associations we see. Um, so that's um, their influence significantly by those gradients and climate and topography and so on. They're also helped by the scale of the site. Um, and its position latitudinally. So we've got a real kind of interesting mix that we, we can see within the flow country. So just to kind of go a bit further into the, this kind of uh, uh, issue of carbon sequestration and storage. And this, these two images are just to show you some of the really important plants within this and how they work. And really the sphagnums are, are, are probably the most important. They tend to grow in very waterlogged settings. So you can see in this right-hand image, although we've got a beautiful flower coming up, that's a bog bean. Um, you can see that the submerged nature of the sphagnum there just kind of um, lurking uh, beneath the surface. And that means uh, and, and it's only the very top part of the sphagnum moss that is effectively alive in inverted commas. Um, the rest of it is effectively being, being kind of incorporated into the peat that is slowly accumulating below it. And the fact that they are kind of dying effectively in, in disoxic or oxygen poor settings means that all of that carbon is locked into the peat. So really good news in terms of trying to take uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So just to run through um, a few facts and figures, um, I think there's some, you know, some really interesting um, headlines here in terms of, well, peatlands cover just 3% of the world's land surface, and yet they hold nearly 30% of the soil carbon. So they're, they, 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 they punch above their weight, I suppose, is how we might um, term that. In terms of the UK, um, 150 million tonnes of carbon are stored in the UK's forests. There are 400 million tonnes of carbon in the flow country alone. So that gives some perspective. I mean, 
don't get me wrong, forests are really important in our fight against climate change. But when we talk about peatlands, they're they're the kind of climate change superpower when we think about things that we can do to help protect it. And of course, although they can be really powerful in the way they um, can sequester carbon, there's also potential threats around them being drained um, for agriculture or, or for forest planting, used for peat extraction, um, burning and, and overgrazing. So these are all potential threats and some of which have existed in the full country and there's ways in which we can tackle them. And of course, if we have damaged peatlands, they're not only not sequestering carbon, but they can actually start releasing carbon. So we really need to make sure they're in as, as, best, um, in as best condition as we can. So the flow country is an interesting kind of history. And in fact, when we look at why, why we've got to this stage of nominating it for, um, for world heritage status, we can actually go back to events that, that were actually um, kind of going on in the, in the mid 1980s. And this left hand image kind of demonstrates those. You can see the beautiful pool systems stretching out in the center of this image, but then all of these plow marks around and about plowing right out into the pool systems. I think a number of machines were actually lost uh, permanently into some of these bogs. And this was all due to a big push for forestry. And you can see forestry just in the background of this, of this image. And so effectively at this time, the Joint Nature Conservancy Council kind of went, oh, hang on, we better go and just check what we, what we might be losing here. And, and that resulted eventually in, in, in the publication. In fact, I've got it. I always have it beside me, this really important um, publication, which is the flow country. Um, really excellent piece of work by Richard Lindsay and co-authors. And what they realized was the true importance of this region from an ecological and biological perspective. And tucked away at the very back of that book, in fact, it does mention that it would be ideally suited to world heritage uh, status. And I kind of, now and again, when I look at this book, I wish they'd done it then because they actually compiled such a good uh, document that's almost a, a nomination dossier. Um, but but we're, we're basically going through that process now to, to put together an updated version. Anyway, that's a bit of a digression. Um, but but it was through this, this kind of uh, damage that we realized how important the site was. And in fact, what we're now able to do is we're able to go to some of these areas that were planted and restore them. And so the flow country is actually at the forefront of research into how best to, to restore peatlands that have been under afforestation and had drainage um, done to them. And this is an image actually, it's on that same Dreek day that uh, the, those mosses were looking so beautiful, um, looking out across an area where there has been forestry and it's been restored. In fact, I think I've, I've walked across this initial more grass dominated area to the, to the, the bit in the background there to take those, those earlier photos. And we can see in fact, that the restoration is really having a having great effect um, in bringing back, back the peatlands. There's obviously an element of, of kind of vegetation succession that has to happen, but eventually as the, as the, the, air, the land becomes more and more uh, waterlogged, it will move back to being a, a, a true functional uh, part of the blanket bog. And one of the things that's been ongoing to do this, this is again maybe a bit scientific, but I think we can we can take it into more slightly more romantic um, a sphere and talk about um, understanding the, the health of the blanket bog by looking at how well what, what has been termed is as, as bog breathing. So and it's this really nice thought that well what happens with with peatlands through the, the seasons is they expand and they contract. And so you can imagine it almost like someone's chest, someone lying on their back and their chest rising up and down and being healthy. And and if if we can understand how how that um, expansion and contraction occurs across the whole land surface within the peatlands, we can understand how healthy it is. It expands and contracts more if it's healthy. There's a, there's a lot more differentiation you can do in that, and it's really interesting looking how those changes differ depending on on the the dominant uh, vegetation cover but what's what what this diagram tries to show and it's a little bit maybe a little bit too multicolored, but is particularly down in the bottom right there's areas that are outlined in white and they're areas which were once forestry and are now being restored to blanket bog and we can see some of these areas are in this this red color and that red color is representative of sphagnum kind of ground cover and it effectively it's saying if you've got sphagnum ground cover you've got full full restoration and it's breathing like a like a a healthy blanket bog 
interestingly, there's actually some areas with 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 woodlands still on it, which are actually behaving in a healthy manner as well. And this is partially because of these hydrological units that I was talking about. If you have trees planted on a on a part of a hydrological unit, it can still function as a healthy blanket bog. But what's really good about that as well is it suggests that the sooner you get those trees down, then the sooner that actually it will it will be able to restore it to being a really um, fully a full contributor to the to that system so there's real kind of positives about the restoration we can do just to i think i'm swinging here between kind of positive and negative and just on a kind of slightly negative note we do just need to consider that um and maybe it's just putting it in the perspective of how important this is but there's a concept that's been kind of um, published around recently about irrecoverable carbon in earth's ecosystems and it it's highlighted in this concept that um, kind of high density peatlands, mangroves and old growth forests and marshes are really, really important in that sense. And this is in essence just saying, look, if, if we lose these, we won't have the time to get them back. And they're really, really important to us. So we really need to have that in our minds when we're thinking about um, which areas are to, to kind of invest in and consider as important when we're thinking about trying to tackle climate change. So just to give you a kind of a, a summary and an overview, hopefully um, that's given you an introduction to the flow country, where it is. Um, I mean, just keep on going north in, in the UK and you'll get to it eventually, I suppose, is the, in essence, uh, what it is and why it's there. Um, I've also kind of gone through, okay, so why is it so important against in our fight against uh, climate change? And I think that's a really, really important element. And you can see that by the fact that we're including that within our kind of... Um, our attributes that we consider to be um, nominating it for. Um, looked at some of the challenges that it faces in terms of largely historical elements of the landscape and how we're overcoming them. And then just kind of touched on, on the global global perspective of this is really, really important. Um, so yeah, let's let's kind of pay attention and, uh, and make sure we learn more. And I think that's that's kind of one of the elements that I think is so important from a world heritage perspective as well, because by being nominated for World Heritage, the Flow Country would become the first uh, property um, to be nominated, which is which is a peatland, um, and, and and it can act as a flagship for peatlands throughout the rest of the world in terms of um, highlighting their importance. So one last image, and this time not on a Drich day, with a nice blue sky in the background reflecting in this beautiful uh, pool that we see here, and just to say uh, thank you for for attending this this talk, and if you've got, want to find out any more um there's a there is a website um the uk and there'll be information updates on there as well so thank you thank you stephen it's always a pleasure to listen to somebody presenting something which they live breathe and know about you can learn so much from books but there's nothing better than having somebody who knows what the call of the birds are in the morning why the weather feels and everything else so that was um a really vivid picture of the flow country and, and thanks for that Please do jump on the Q&A if you've got any questions, but I, I've got some burning questions on this. I, I hope I don't put you on the spot too much, but um, you, you said that the, uh, the study that was done at, at pointed towards why it would be an ideal World Heritage Site. But have other alternatives been considered, such as, you know, why is it not a national park or, um, as we have in England, an area of outstanding natural beauty? Why, why the World Heritage designation? Yes, yeah, a really interesting one. I mean, so I should say the majority of it, about 80% of the proposed site is triple SI and SPA and SAC and Ramsar. So it's as highly protected as it can be. Um, the, the whole national park thing, I think, is an interesting one. I mean, as you'll be aware, despite national parks being invented by a Scot, um, they, Scotland only recently relatively got national parks. Um, and I think national parks are often really looked upon as recreational facilities and currently the flow country doesn't really fit that bill but actually when you do look at the national park kind of um designation um if that's the right term it is largely about conservation and, and caring so it's something in fact I've, i'll be meeting with uh the the msp for the region um later on today to discuss some of these these finer points because I think it, 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 the region itself could benefit from the sort of investment that a national park um, would bring, 
Um, but there's there's maybe some halfway house between that um, because that's the biggest thing with with national park um, designation basically comes a large package of funding and currently the infrastructure across the the flow country is it's built for the low population that you kind of mentioned so lots of single track roads one of the main roads through it in fact i was looking because there's a road closure while we're going to be undertaking some consultation going on and i hadn't realized it was an a road um, but it is single track for all of its 40 odd miles so it's, um, you know the, there are big challenges in how we are going to um, meet the demands of potential visitors uh, and and then balance those with how the locals are, are using the area so hopefully that that kind of answer, answers your question. I, th I think there's there's definitely a case for it um, having some level of of greater importance towards a national park, um, but we'll but we'll see how that that kind of goes in the future. Okay, we got some questions coming up on the chat, and you just touched on this about the um, the local people. Uh, I mean, what are the stories? What what, what are the, what's the reaction of the local people who are affected? Have you got broad support? Um, and especially sort of with agriculture, we always get this um, interest from buildings about, um, sorry, from businesses about how it might restrict them. And what can you say about, about that? Yeah, so we've got, I mean, we did an initial um, consultation on a much wider area and we had about 80% um, support from the local communities. Um, there are concerns, but um, they tend to be around yeah, well, I mean, there are tensions in any landscape, I think is the best way to put it, isn't there? There's tensions between forestry, there's tensions between deer management, and in this case, actually, wind farms are another big part of the of the story. Um, and that's kind of always been the case. But, but when you look at, I mean, one of the things that we're really focused on with the World Heritage Site proposals is that there, is, there are existing protections in place and there are existing policies in place to protect deep peat. Um, so that's peat over 50 centimetres. They might change that to be 30 centimetres in the near future. But, but so, uh, 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 and in fact, then the, the existing designations. So I think from the local perspective, it's just important that the benefits that come with this are, are really kind of um, capitalised on. And as we know from other World Heritage Sites, it's often about how much is put in as to how much can be got out of it. And so, for instance, from a deer management perspective, you know, I don't think there'd be really any changes, particularly to the deer management policies. But what we would be able to be saying is, well, actually, if you're having stalking on your land, which is a very, sorry, I realize I'm talking to people in maybe the south of England that aren't as au fait with some of these land practices, but effectively hunting um, is very traditional in, in a lot of these areas for deer. Um, you know, you'd be able to sell that, that activity is going to take place in a World Heritage Site. So that's actually going to be a, a seal of approval and, a, and a potentially a selling point, as well as that, the, the, um, the produce in terms of venison. Again, you know, there's potential for marketing that would increase the value of that. And similarly, being able to, you know, tourism is, is a big part of the, the economy in the region. Um, and there's some tension around the volume of tourists that we've had recently because of COVID and so on. Uh, particularly, there's been an initiative that started before that called the North Coast 500, which is a, a kind of road touring route that some people may have heard of. But the, the thing is to be able to go, well, actually, let's get people off of that. Let's get them spending more time in the landscape because I'd, the flow country is not, you know, you're not going to be able to go there and get your Instagram kind of hit, as it were. It's somewhere you've got to go and spend time. You've got to get out there. And I think one of the, the taglines was, you know, the closer you look, the more you see. And it's very, very true. Um, so it is that case of of spending time in the region and, and really getting to know it. So I think it's, as with anywhere, there's, there are conflicts in the land uses, um, but but the a World Heritage Site is, is, is not going to... Um, it's not going to impact really on, on many of those land uses in any way other than following on from existing policies that are in place. Um, certainly the Scottish government has a, has a good grasp of the importance of peatlands and I mean from the point of view of things like restoration they've invested hugely and, and will continue to invest in restoration of peatlands over the coming years. So, yeah. Okay I'm just looking at the, um, at the questions but um, so do you, you actively want visitors and um, in terms of dealing with them when they arrive, will they, will, are you proposing or have you got a visitor centre and things like that? How will you deal with the sort of interpretation issues? 
Yeah, this is going to be a, a big thing. Um, there are already there's already some infrastructures. So the RSPB, who are one of the partners in the project, have a have a visitor center, and have some infrastructure in place. They they have you know do kind of peatland safaris as well using some of the the forestry tracks. Funnily enough, so there's some benefits to some of the forestry um, infrastructure that's already there. Um, but this is this is a this is a huge element, and then you know we're, we're looking to submit the bid um, at the end of this year. Inscription would be mid 2024, and that gives us a year and a half to really try and get to the bottom of how we're going to improve the infrastructure to allow people to allow people to spend more time um, in the region. But I think it's a uh, you know this there's, there's be, there'll be elements of trying to encourage local estates to try and follow practices that are being done by RSPB and monetize that in terms of yeah offering people the opportunities to get out there in 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 a in as easy a way as possible but there's also the potential i think as i mentioned you know through talking to central government see what funding might be available to try and expand um how we might approach this as i say thinking the scottish government recently um committed to two new national parks um i would be saying to them well okay maybe you want two new national parks but a world heritage site's really important as well so might there be some central funding to try and help with that certainly one of my experiences um prior to this role by some considerable distance was uh visiting tasmania and tasmania has got a natural world heritage site across the central regions i think it's the tasmanian wilderness it's called mm -hmm. and there's a walk you could do right across it um called the oh uh, the overland trail that's what it's called and i would say that 90 percent of it is on duckboard because it crosses significant amounts of peatland despite the site not being designated for that um or in, uh, inscribed for that feature um so there's there's definitely potential there you know to to try and put together long distance pathways or, or various other things um to help and we do have uh, a number of museums already with displays around the flow country um one at thurso one in helmsdale and one at uh, Strathnaver for those that know the local area, um, but basically around the edges, um, because as I say in the middle, there's there's not an awful lot there. So yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay. The um, there's a question asked. I think you and I know the answer to this one, but it, about the have you worked or benefited from experience and support of other Scottish World Heritage sites? Yes, absolutely. I mean the um, so Historic Environment Scotland are the kind of custodians of world heritage um, in in Scot in Scotland, but we of course. In fact, the Flow Country would be the would be the the first wholly natural site um, for Scotland. However, I mean, obviously, St Kilda is uh, joint natural and cultural. So, not only I think does does this bid or has it benefited from the the kind of Scottish site, but also from the the, the English sites as well. And in fact, we have a kind of well, <laughs> we have a consultant working with us who worked on the on the um, Jurassic Coast for a long time as well, so so that's been been really really handy also. And do you, um, James Slater asks whether you've got any knowledge of the Somerset levels um, way down close to us, which is a, 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 ah, well, a really interesting landscape. It is absolutely. In fact, you know, this is a a useful tie into my youth when I was I don't know, I don't, four or five or so. I did actually live in Somerset um, and I have been to the Glastonbury Festival a couple of times, um, but that didn't maybe, the latter not giving me the best knowledge, but um, it is somewhere I'm aware of. And in fact, my, my stepdad wrote a, a book about that area as well um, some time ago. Um, there, and in fact, I also lived in Cambridge, so which has a similar level of, of kind of these low lying peatlands that go out to the coast. So they're kind of a different, as I said, a different kind of peatland because they're fed by being in a low, position and therefore have have lots of um lots of moisture fed into them so it's not rain fed and um, particularly in the east anglian examples um but yeah they have had significant uh, drainage relative to the the peatlands um of, of caithness and sutherland it's, it's very interesting when you go on satellite imagery and you, you wander around the, the flow country you, it looks like there's lots of drains um, but many of them are, are kind of filled in. But these features, these scars in the landscape persist for, for an exceedingly long period of time. And of course, the drainage that was carried out on the, the Somerset levels and the the, um, the fens of East Anglia were, uh, has been so intense. I think one of the most uh, striking 
my my more more recent knowledge is is uh, the the Cambridgeshire Fens, so I'll maybe refer back to that. But I think at um, Home Fen, where you go and you see this this post that was driven in um, prior to the the draining, and you see that that post is now about four meters sticking out of the ground, and um, because the, the peat has has shrunk, and I mean that's yeah. The way those peatlands are managed is is not ideal for um, the carbon. I think is maybe the best way to put it. Okay, and just um, just on that carbon, um, um, Robert Piper asks if you could just say a little bit more about the relative importance of carbon storage. I mean, I know you've you've touched on this, but no, these are hugely important areas, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, yes, the balance between the amount of carbon that's stored and the amounts that, that are being sequestered um, is an interesting one. And I must say, I'd, I'd have to actually try and go and get the figures in front of me. Um, I wouldn't want to make a mistake on this. Obviously, it's been forming for uh, for around, well, eight to 10,000 years. Um, and therefore, that figure of 400, is it 400 million, I think I gave, <laughs> uh, of, of uh, tons of, of carbon. Um, a lot of that is is historic, of course, um, but that's not to say it's important to make sure it, we ensure it's locked in there, and that that we continue to, to actually se sequester. Um, but yeah, I, I must apologise. I have to go and um, dig out some actual figures on the on the kind of seque sequestration. Blech. I'd have to learn how to say it first. Uh, the rate of sequestration is maybe a better way of putting it. Um, so yeah, I apologise for that. No, no problem at all. The um. We have subjected you to a great many questions. I know that that's always the most exhausting part of any presentation. <laughs> Thank you um, very much for a hugely illuminating presentation for all your work so far in pushing this. We also know what a, a, a long haul it is to um, to push these inscriptions through and all best wishes for, for getting it over the line. It's a, a really exciting site. Um, lots of challenges, but they're being really well met. So we're slightly early, but um, I think, um, thank you, Stephen. We'll, we, will, we will close the session there. Um, and we look forward to the next one, which takes us to the slate landscape of Northwest Wales. So we're still in the uplands, but something um, a, a little different there. Um, and I hope to everybody that you can join us for that one. Uh, please do continue to use the, um, the questions and answer chat, um, chat room with the questions and answers. And thanks to everyone who does. Um, so goodbye for now, and we will see you again at one o'clock. Welcome back, everybody, and um, big welcome to those who are just joining us for the World Heritage Day webinar 2022. Uh, if you are just joining us, quick recap on where we've been this morning. We started the day in what's now a rather cloudy bath um, and had a really good session about interpretation and participation from volunteers with some really cutting edge examples there. Then we went way up north to um, Scotland and heard about the what will now be referred to as the beautiful peatlands of the of the flow country. Uh, and now we're going to North Wales. It's another landscape this time, but quite different from the flow country. And this this one has been really shaped by the hand of, of mankind. A fascinating landscape, but with lots of tales and stories of um, human interaction and involvement of local people. Here to tell us about that, we have Louise Barker. Um, hi, Louise. Uh, Hello. Louise is, um, uh, senior archaeologist with the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historic Monument of Wales, and part of the Gwynedd County Council team that developed the Slate Landscape of Northwest Wales World Heritage nomination, and an excellent nomination that was too. Uh, she's now part of the management group for the World Heritage Site. And as we just touched upon, it's an exact exceptional example of an industrial cultural landscape um, inscribed in 2021. Um, so big congratulations on that inscription, Louise, and, and over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sat in Aberystwyth in Wales, which is equally slightly dull and uh, windy today, but hello everyone. I'm just gonna do the screen share for my uh, presentation now. Well, um, thank you very much for the invite to talk to you today about the state landscape of Northwest Wales. That's the UK and Wales's newest World Heritage Site, which was inscribed in July 2021. And we're really very excited and pleased to be here celebrating our first ever World Heritage Day. I'm going to start with the momentous moment on the 28th of July last year when UNESCO formally announced that the state landscape of Northwest Wales um, was a World Heritage Site. 
And here on this image, we can see Lord, Lord Davis Wigley, chair of the nomination partnership, giving our acceptance speech, along with messages of congratulations from member states all around the world, which were received in the chat box of the Zoom link. I mean, obviously the past few years have been challenging ones for us all, and it's meant that we've yet to really officially celebrate the success across the new World Heritage Site. And so we're hoping to hold our proper celebration on our one year anniversary. Um, but first and foremost, it's important to highlight that I'm speaking to you on behalf of a very strong and committed team, which has been led by Gwyneth Council and in partnership with six other organisations, um, including the Royal Commission, uh, my place of work. Um, I'm sure a theme running across all of the talks today is that World Heritage can't be delivered in isolation and involves um, a large amount of work. Um, for the slate landscape, the nomination was some 12 years in the making and it required the support of many additional stakeholders. And most importantly, that's the communities that make up uh, the new World Heritage Site. Uh, with this talk, I want to introduce you to the new World Heritage Site, uh, to the landscapes and monuments that comprise it, and explain really why it's of uh, World Heritage importance. So, as an initial scene setting, the slate landscape of Northwest Wales comprises six areas in the county of Gwynedd, which are shown in red on the map here. These represent the heartland of the slate industry and comprise not only the slate quarries and mines, one example shown here in the image is that of Gosselai slate quarry, but also the settlements that sprang up around them to house the workforce and the transport routes that were constructed to convey the finished products. It's a large World Heritage Site, the largest in Wales and actually one of the largest in the UK. To become a World Heritage Site, you must meet at least one of 10 criteria outlined by UNESCO, and the slate landscape was inscribed by the World Heritage Committee under the two criteria outlined here. That's centred around the transformation of the landscape and the importance of the industry and developments in architecture and technology. The period it covers is the heyday of the industry from 1780 to 1940, and it was during this time that the industry was capitalized and becomes the largest slate producer in the world. Slates were exported to every continent. The industry peaked in the last few decades of the 1800s with employment reaching around 16,000 men and production some 500,000 tons a year. And I'll now just look at these two criteria in a little bit more detail. So criterion two focuses on the impact of the slate landscape in developments in architecture and technology. And in relation to architecture, this relates to the fact that during the heyday of the industry, particularly during the 1800s, Welsh slate dominated the global market as a roofing element. Basically its weight to cost ratio made it worth exporting significantly on a global scale. And Welsh slate has been used all over the world for buildings of all kinds, uh, from roofing the huge volumes of terraced housing needed to house the growing population of Britain's industrial towns and cities. And Wales's output in the 1800s would have covered well over 13 million such houses. But it also roofed prestigious architectural projects around the world. Um, for example, the Royal Exhibition building in Melbourne, Australia, shown on the right here, which is roofed with Pedrin Quarry Slate. The second part of the, of the Criterion 2 relates to developments in technology. Um, technology, skilled workers and knowledge transfer from slate quarry to slate quarry was fundamental to the development of the slate industry, both at home and abroad. The bottom left image is the Stateville Cemetery in Pennsylvania, where a number of the gravestones are inscribed in Welsh and commemorate the Welshmen who arrived to work in the local state industry. But really, above all else, it was railway, railway building, the narrow gauge railways of the Welsh slate industry that had the biggest impact across the world. Developing out of the South Wales Iron Railroads, the starting point in the slate industry was the Penryn Railroad of 1801, which led to the most significant the Festiniog Railway seen here in Itanagrishiae. This opened for horse and gravity operation in 1836 and steam from 1863 
and today operates as a heritage railway. And the Festinial Railway's ingenious use of topography in a challenging mountainous environment was imitated worldwide. For example, it inspired the Darjeeling Himalayan Railway shown here, which has been a World Heritage Site since 1999. This still uses distinctive locomotives contemporary with those used in the slate industry. And these were ideal for working the sharp curves and steep gradients needed to operate in mountainous environments. The exploitation of Wales' natural resources lies at the heart of Criterion 4, fully encapsulating the this definition of this cultural landscape as the combined works of nature and of man. The largest deposits of high quality slate in the world lay in Gwynedd, the Cambrian purple slate vein and the Aldovetian slate vein, which are shown in purple and yellow on this map. This was exploited on a monumental scale, the dip of the slate vein dictating how the slate was quarried. For example, steps cut into the mountainside in pits on the valley floor um, or through mining underground. And the World Heritage Site showcases all of these methods as seen in this collection of images. This is also an area of high rainfall and where captured water provided low cost energy in the form of water power. The size of wells also meant that the quarries lay within a relatively short distance to the sea or railway network, and this was a crucial factor to commercial success. So all of these factors helped transform what was previously a largely rural landscape into an industrial landscape on a monumental scale. And wherever we find slate quarries and mines, we will also find the transport systems which conveyed the finished product, winding their ways across mountains and along valleys, and the settlements where the workforce lived. These three elements are what makes this landscape, and what makes this a world heritage landscape is its survival and the way in which we can easily see and understand the relationship between these three elements. This wonderful aerial view of the Festiniog landscape encapsulates this. We have the quarries on the edge of the image overlooking the town of Blyneye Festiniog, created to house the workforce, and then running all the way along the Vale of Festiniog, along the edge of the mountains is the Festiniog Railway, which conveyed the Finnish slate products to Porth Maddock Harbour in the far distance, and then on to the wider world. So um, I'm going to move on now to take a look at each of the landscapes and highlights just some of the sites and monuments that make up the New World Heritage Site. So a map of the area and some of the key monuments within each one are shown here. But one of the most often asked questions is, is with many hundreds of slate quarries in Wales, how were the six areas that make up the New World Heritage Site chosen? Well, Gwynedd was chosen as it represents the heartland of the slate industry in Wales. About 90% of Welsh output came from Gwynedd, and it was here during the industry's heyday that the most productive quarries were located and where the distinctive technologies like the narrow gauge railway were developed. Of the six areas chosen, all, re all represent a complete landscape, the quarry, transport links and the associated settlements I've just discussed. They are the best surviving examples, the most authentic, and ones which best fulfill the two criteria noted earlier. They showcase different forms of quarrying, development of transport routes from roads, rivers to railways, and different forms of settlement from the lavish houses of the wealthy owners to the communities which sprang up to house workmen and their families. And that's not to say that other slate areas aren't important, far from it, and the hope is that these areas will also gain benefit from the status and can share in telling the story of the industry of Wales. So I'm going to start my tour of the new Slate World Heritage Site in Area 1, Penryn Slate Quarry in Bethesda and the Ogwen Valley to Port Penryn. Um, this part of the World Heritage Site encompasses a nine kilometre long industrial landscape through the Ogwen Valley. It's a slate quarrying landscape that was developed directly by its aristocratic owners and represents the first area of the slate industry of Northwest Wales to be extensively capitalised for global markets. Here we see the entire process flow of the industry from the quarry phase to export harbour and three contrasting forms of settlement. 
Penryn Castle and Park was the Welsh home of the Pennant family, the aristocratic dynasty that owned and developed this late landscape and whose founding wealth in the late 1700s came from their sugar growing estates in Jamaica, worked by enslaved labour. This fortune was invested here and the wealth available is evident in the scale and form of the quarry workings, as well as through the introduction of innovative methods and technologies which other slate producing areas in the region sought to emulate. For example, at Penryn Quarry, Pennant's engineers developed a system of regular step benches or galleries to work the rock face with the waste rock tips fed by railway lines. By the early 19th century, this was the largest slate quarry in the world. I should also say that part of Penryn remains an active working quarry the upper area of the quarry extending back into the mountainside. However, all um, it should be noted that all active quarry areas lie outside of the World Heritage boundary. Uh, the quarry also led the way in the application of water power, and this part of the World Heritage site is remarkable for its rare variety of surviving water-driven machinery. At Pemrin Quarry, two water balance shafts survive, superseding the earlier inclined systems. These were used to raise slate and waste rock from the quarry pit. And underground, we have elements such as a water pressure engine, which was installed in 1872 to pump water from the quarry pit up to the main drainage level. Adjacent to the quarry lies Velin Vower, the site of an innovative slate slab mill of 1802, which is the earliest known location in the world to have used circular saws to cut stone. Here, water powered the quarry's processing and engineering complex, and two 19th century water wheels survive one which powered the slate slab mill, and the other the foundry. For transporting the finished slate product, the Penryn Slate Quarry built a 0.6 metre gauge iron railroad, which was a design ancestor of many narrow gauge railways built subsequently. This used horse traction along lightly graded sections and counterbalanced inclines to connect the quarry with Port Penryn. Features along it, such as the Keggin Bridge and Pont Macogion Incline Winding House shown here, are amongst the earliest upstanding railway structures in the world. In the 1870s, Charles Easton Spooner of the West Festiniog Railway designed the steam powered replacement, which operated until 1962. And the end point was Port Penryn on the Menai Straits, the main shipping point for Penryn Slate from the late 1700s to the mid 1900s. And this continues in use today as a commercial harbour. Um, two other contrasting forms of settlement also form part of this landscape. A planned settlement with a company in land, stylized cottages and houses were built by workers was built for workers by the controlling hand of the Penryn estate in 1843 at Manithlandagai. And this contrasts with the Festa village, initially created on freehold land by independent minded quarrymen and their families who preferred not to live on the Penryn estate. And here, the ir irregular and winding streets and planned uh, and plain of dwellings really contrast with the uh, more orderly expansion of village onto the Penryn estate land. Uh, so moving across the valley um, to area two of the World Heritage Site, which is set within the breathtaking landscape of Wales's highest mountain, uh, Snowdon. And it is dominated by the spectacular gallery rock faces, inclined plains and tips of the Dinorwig Slate Quarry, once the second largest slate quarry in the world, just missing out on that title by its neighbour that I've just discussed, Penryn. And this was worked between 1787 and 1969. Um, like Penryn, the wealth of an aristocratic landowner underpinned the development of the quarry. And in this instance, it was the um, Asherton Smith family of the Vinyl Estate. Dinoric Quarry contains over 30 galleries for processing um, quarried slate, each linked to a rubble tip. Each is also linked to one of the counterbalanced incline railway systems that are a key feature of the quarry. These transported the finished slate products down the mountain, the weight of the loaded wagons heading down the mountain, pulling back up the mountain, the empty wagons. 
And at Vivian, uh, seen here on the, the right, a separate department of Dinorwick Quarry, part of its incline has been restored to fully working order. Um, after closure in 1969, the site was purchased by a company which went on to develop a hydroelectricity scheme here. And this meant that almost all structures survived. And for example, the Australia Gallery with its huge mill building complete with saw tables, along with its electrically powered equipment dating from the 1920s, is a good example of such survival high on the mountainside. And outside of the quarry, a remarkable feature is the quadrangular engineering complex that served the quarry, known as Gilvagdi. It is now the home of the National Slate Museum. The complex was built in 1870, and all the machinery throughout the building was at one time powered by an enormous water wheel. Today, it is the largest surviving water wheel on the British mainland, 50 feet in diameter and still in working order. The housing enclosing the wheel can be seen here behind the main quadrangular building on the photograph. The best preserved slate hospital in the industry is also a feature of this slate landscape. It is prominently located so that no one could miss the benign intent of the owning estate. The Donoric Slate Quarry Hospital was built in the 1860s and was at the forefront of medical care for injured workmen. It is one of three hospitals established in the Welsh slate industry, all of which are included in the World Heritage Site, and is today also a museum run by Gwynedd Council with much of its early med medical equipment on display. The workforce um, that worked in the quarry lived in cottages built on the mountain common land seen in the top left of this village, and also in, near, in the nearby villages of Denyolin and Clortebont. But men were also provided with weekly accommodation at the Anglesey Barracks, built in the early 1870s adjacent to the operational area of Dinora Quarry. These were for workmen who lived too far away to commute daily, such as from Anglesey. A bedroom in each unit had space for four men, and these were in use until 1937 when they were condemned. And finally, for this area, in relation to the transport element of the landscape, here we see a full range and development, all of which can be traced as relic features or continue in use today as roads and a tourist railway. Originally, a network of purpose built roads was used for transporting slate. These led down to the shores of Llimpadan from where they were taken by boat. Later roads also led to the tidal harbour on the Menai Straits. But in 1825, the quarry's first railroad was opened, inspired by Penryn Quarry's 1801 railroad. Then in the 1840s, a far more sophisticated railway was opened, running along the shore of Llimpadan, and this was the first of the Slate Quarry Railways to use steam locomotives. So moving on to area three. Now this takes us further south in Gwynedd to the Nantla Valley landscape. Um, very much a contrast to the mountainous terrain of the two areas I've just described. Here, ownership was also different. Quarries belonged to many different landowners and therefore developed as many separate quarries between which much of the older rural landscape remains, clearly showcasing the transformation from a traditional agricultural economy to an industrial society. Here, geology and topography meant that slate deposits could only be opened out of pits, now water-filled and up to 150 metres deep. As a result, ingenious methods were employed to raise blocks and rubble, as well as to pump water out of the deep, confined workings. At Penibrin and Dorothea quarries, local engineers developed chain incline ropeways to raise and lower slate blocks, running from pit bottoms to the massive slate bastions. Um, the left-hand image shows the slate bastion, ta bastion towering over the Dorothea pit, and it is also shown in this beautiful painting of 1850, which shows how both water and steam power were in use at the quarry. At the adjacent quarries of uh, Blinakai and Penaorsef, steam and electrically powered aerial roadway systems were later used, a technology imported from stone quarries of Scotland and known as Blondins after the famous tightrope walker, Charles Blondin. 
dewatering of the quarry pits was essential in Nantla, and here technology imported from the metal mines of Devon and Cornwall was used. This included um, a flat rod pumping system driven by water wheels, but at, and at Dorothea, one of the gems of the World Heritage Site, a Cornish beam engine used from 1906 until 1951. The engine still in its original roofed engine house was one of the last such engines ever manufactured by the Holman brothers of Camborne and is one of the own, of only 16 to survive worldwide, but the only one to survive with its original boilers. So the tide of settlement brought about by the expansion of the quarries is evident in many forms from many forms from the adaptation of um, an earlier farmhouse and farm buildings into managers houses and barracks for both quarrymen and their families. It is also evident in the expansion of settlement uh, from the scattered cottages and field plots on the mountain common at Kilgwin enclosed without any legal authority from the 1798. Um, and it's also evident in the planned small village of Nantla, which was developed from the 1860s to the 1890s by Penny Orsef Quarry. And finally, this beautiful image shows the horse worked Nantla railway with Prince and Corwin pulling slate wagons from Penny Orsef Quarry. The railway served the valley's slate quarries and opened in 1828 and operating with relatively little change until 1963. It was the first public railway in the slate industry built with Liverpool Finance and with the advice of the famous Stevenson family of railway engineers. And it survives as a relic feature throughout this World Heritage Area. OK, so we've reached Area 4, which encompasses the remote upland valleys of Cumpenant and Cumastradlin in the Snowdonia National Park. And for me, my favourite part of the World Heritage Site both the Gosselai and Prince of Wales quarries were developed between 1850 and 1870, the sort of golden age of slate industry in Gwynedd, and their development testifies to the fact that everyone invested in the slate industry expected to make a fortune. Huge sums of money were invested in these two quarries from 1850 onwards, but both failed within a few years of opening because of the poor quality of their rock. However, what's not good for shareholders is good for World Heritage as the lack of later quarrying means that features and evidence of working practices from this date in time survive. These really are perfect time capsules. Each quarry is set in a stunning landscape setting, the Prince of Wales literally clinging to the mountainside. Both have their blast shelters, slate makers shelters known as Gwaliai, barracks, office, smithy and quarry managers housing surviving. At Gosselai, we also have the often talked about feature and ex exceptionally impressive corbelled retaining wall, which protected the quarry's railway from the waste tips beside it. Both quarries were connected by railway to the sea at Porth Maddock, and both had water powered slate slab mills. All these elements are included in the World Heritage Boundary. The three storied Anisapandi Mill, which served Gosevai Quarry, is one of the most iconic monuments of the industry, though totally untypical of it. It is grand and architecturally ambitious structure and is quite unlike most slate mills. It is thought to be based on a railway workshop or foundry, and its designer, James Brunlees, seems to have given little thought to how the structure would operate, and it was left to local contractors to work out how to equip the building. A curved embankment seen to the right of the building carried raw blocks in and the finished products away from the mill and connected to the Gosselai Railway. In stark contrast, the Prince of Wales Mill is more than all a single storey structure for more practical and far more practical for manoeuvring and processing large blocks of stone. It was built in 1864 and shows an interchange of techniques with Penryn Quarry, where its designer, John Francis, the Penry manager and his son also remodeled the Vellinvower slate slab mill. Its water supply was carried from a res reservoir on a wooden trough on a row of stone pillars that you can see in this image. Running from the mill, the green sinuous line heading around the hillside is the, is the route of the grandly named Gosselai Junction and Porth Maddock Railways, which transported the slate out of the valley. 
So accommodation for workers was an essential feature given this remote upland location and barracks are present at both quarries. The barracks at Prince of Wales are a row of three room single storey cottages. Barracks generally provided crowded, unhygienic and uncomfortable accommodation. And it's really quite sobering to think of Prince of Wales quarries four cottages housing much of its workforce, around 200 men at its height. But perhaps the most remarkable settlement in this area is Trevoris, just west of Gosethai Quarry. It was built in 1857 as a company village for quarry workers and their families. It had 18 pairs of two room cottages arranged along three streets. Its ground plan was evidently drawn up in an office because it was laid out with almost total disregard of the rugged, boggy and uneven landscape. And it must have been a very challenging place to live and, and records show that it suffered an outbreak of smallpox in 1859. It was abandoned when Gossethai Quarry closed a few years later. As with the Penryn slate landscape, Area 5 encapsulates the entire process flow of the industry from the five quarries that form part of the Festiniog landscape, all owned by different companies, down to the export harbour at Porth Maddock. Here we also see a different quarrying technique. The angle of the slate vein meant that the most convenient method for quarrying slate was to work it underground. Slate rock that was not good enough to be split and trimmed into roofing slate would be discarded, and these form the huge waste tips of distinctive feature of any slate quarry. And in fact, up to 90% of the rock extracted was usually classified as waste. Beneath the Festiniog landscape lie over 100 kilometres of levels, tunnels and spectacular honeycomb chambers, where in many cases machinery, complete inclined planes and railway systems survive intact. The underground workings also pres preserve smaller artefacts such as the boots, newspapers and cigarette packets. Uh, the Festinio quarries use different forms of power to, upper, to um, power to operate the up haulage inclines that brought slate blocks to the surface to be processed. Um, at Minor Ferrin, the well-preserved late 19th century mill was originally powered by water. At the neighbouring Diffwis quarry, where water was scarce, steam had to be used. The earliest phase of this mill dates to the late 1850s, and it represents one of the earliest integrated mills in the industry. Here, all of the processes for producing roofing slates were carried out in one place. The traditional hand splitting gualii were integrated with the powered machinery used in the initial reduction of the slate blocks. And at Le Lequeth Quarry, electricity was generated at the Panta Avon power station. And this is a rare example of an early 20th century hydroelectric power station. In 1873, the town of Blyneye Festiniog was described as Dina Setlechi, Slate City, as it was the largest town in the slate quarrying areas. The town of Blyneye Festiniog was enriched with shops, pubs, a market hall, which is shown on the image in the bottom right, and a reading room and is one of the most and is the most urban of the slate quarrying settlements in the World Heritage Site. It offered housing for the workmen, the middle classes and the quarry managers. And in contrast to many of the other areas, there was no landed estate influence here, and it was developed around a network of railways and roads. It grew because of the constant stream of people coming here from 1820 onwards to live and work. Almost 12,000 people lived here by the 1880s. And at this point, I just want to take a quick sort of tangent and talk very briefly about the culture and people of the slate industry. World Heritage Site status is attached to the monuments that make up the site. All those features I've been covering in this part of the presentation. Um, through these monuments, we can add the human story about the people that worked and lived here and continue to live and work here today. And this is where the important story of the Welsh language and culture shines through. The workforce for the industry was overwhelmingly local, sourced from the surrounding hinterlands. And that is the crucial factor in why the slate landscape of Northwest Wales retained and retains its distinctive way of life and language. So often marginal cultures that are incorporated into a global industrial system lose this. 
we can tell the story, we can tell this story through the place names, through features such as the caban, where quarrymen took their breaks, through events such as the Penryn strike, and through monuments such as the chapel. Um, Wales's religious identity and the powerful tradition of religious descent is evidenced in numerous chapels across the World War Heritage Site. Um, at various points, there are 40 alone in Blinus Sustiniog, and the chapel is the building which characterises the Welsh landscape and was central to the Slate community's vision of themselves and their values. And uh, the chapels identified very much with the Liberal Party and ultimately the Labour movement. Um, but quickly now returning on to our journey through the Festiniog landscape. Initially, slates from the Festiniog quarries were transported by pack horse and cart to river keys, such as this surviving one on Tuthanissa on the Druid River. Here, slates were loaded into boats and then transferred to ships in Porth Madoc, where a sea embankment had scoured a channel. And locally built schooners, famous for their beauty and their turn of speed, braved the North Sea and the Atlantic. Uh, the Frau Minna Petrusen is just one example, and this was owned by Hugh Parry of Porth Madoc, and its name reflects the slate trading links with Hamburg. Many of the 19, 19th century shipwrecks dotted along the coast of Wales undoubtedly relate to the slate industry, and occasionally the odd piece of cargo can also still be found. But in 1850, 1836, the opening of the Festin New York Railway gave the quarries access to Porth Madoc. The railway was skillfully engineered so wagons could travel by gravity on a downward gradient with horses to haul them back. In 1863, steam locomotives were introduced, um, the final stretch of the journey crossing the Cobb Sea Defence, which was uh, built in 1808. The quays at Porth Madoc were built between 1824 and 1867. And the ballast bank scene at the top left of the right hand image is made up of stones discarded as ballast from slate ships returning without a cargo. So very rapidly we've made it to our final slate area of the World Heritage Site. Um, our final area is located in the Dacini Valley in South Gwynedd and is the most southerly area of the World Heritage Site. This area demonstrates the transfer of knowledge, technology and people from other areas within the World Heritage Site and also the inward investment of wealth from a major English industry, Lancashire Cotton, which created the landscape we see today. Brinegloys Quarry was first opened in the 1840s, though its boom years came 20 years later. Here, both slate slabs and roofing slates were produced from two veins of Ordovician slate. The most prominent visible surviving feature of the quarry is the bastion for a chain incline ropeway system and the pits for the water wheels which powered it. This was a technology brought to the quarry by men from the Nantla Valley. Once the shallow surface open pits had reached a certain depth, the narrow slate vein had to be worked underground and several of the seven floors contained rails, wagons and winches and these floors connected with the open pit from which the chain incline system raised blocks and slate rubble. The village of Abergenorwyn that houses the quarry workforce um, was developed following the lease of the quarry by the McConnell brothers, Lancashire cotton spinners in the 1860s. Many of the houses are built to a design by Manchester architect James Stevens. And this is why the village looks as if it's been transplanted here from a mill town in northwest England. And finally, um, it's always good to end on a steam train. So the Talitlin Railway, completed in 1866, joins Brinegloys Quarry and the village of Abergenol into Tawin and serve both the quarry and public. Though Tawin is next to the sea, the railway was built to connect with the National Railway Network and was the first to do so in Northwest Wales. It continued to run until 1950 when it was threatened with closure due to the death of its owner. A band of enthusiasts formed the Talithlin Railway Preservation Society and they took over running the line in 1951 and they have been operating it ever since. It is the world's first preserved railway and also the inspiration behind the Scarloy Railway in the fictional children's books and television series Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends.
Um, so that's it from me. I hope that's not been too much of a whirlwind tour. Um, and I hope it's given you a good overview of overview and introduction of the new World Heritage Site and perhaps even persuaded you to visit us over in, in Wales. Um, here's a few useful addresses, some website addresses you might find useful, um, including that of the New World Heritage website, Um Finally, I just wanted to say that the Royal Commission's 2015 publication, Welsh Slate, Archaeology and History of an Industry, looks in more detail at the slate industry across Wales. And our online resource Covline has lots more information and images about the wonderful sites mentioned today and other slate quarries and landscapes outside of the World Heritage Site. So, uh, and thank you very much. Thank you, Louise. That, that was a fascinating walk through, fly through and train ride through uh, uh, what is a, a really impressive landscape. And a, a few questions, if, if we may. Yeah. The, um, the functionality, the preserved functionality of the site is, in, is hugely impressive. You know, everything, as you say, from preserved cigarette packets right down through to working ports showing the whole process. But to me, that looks like a conservation nightmare. And, and, and how do you sort of um, plan to tackle it and, and fund it? Um, there's many different ways. Obviously, um, in, in Wales, the system, are the sort of the way the heritage system is, as we use, um, we use the standard planning process and conservation to help manage our sites. So um, the starting point is protection through things such as scheduling um, listed building, parks registers of parks and gardens so um uh, prior to the nomination during the nomination and now um, now as a world heritage site we're just completing the big task of actually protecting huge amounts of the sites and features the sort of individual sites and and monuments so that's one area that we've preserved it we obviously have a, a big man management plan as well that helps with the conservation and protection um we're lucky also in in many ways because of the the location and areas that we're we're located in for example nearly all of the sites are bordered on or within um a national park so that helps greatly in terms of protecting both settings and the landscape of those sites but um it's also a living landscape and i think that's one of the most Im important things to to convey and get across you know th these continue as as working areas the many of the set well nearly all of the settlements are still living settlements and um it was really important in us in developing the bid to make sure we were consulting fully with everybody within these areas to ensure that their voices were heard and and to just get that dialogue going because for a start we can't turn every every settlement every building into a listed building or a conservation area that's that's not possible so the way that we're doing that is is through guidance and through working with communities really showcasing the importance of the areas why they're important i think a lot of people were quite surprised but also very um very honoured now to realise that their house or their village or settlement, which to them is just a sort of, a, you know, late 19th century, early 20th century settlement is of world importance. So we're doing things like um, just in production now, we have um, style guides and setting guides, which explain a bit more to people about the settlements and what makes them in, in so important in terms of, of their layout. So many, many different levels of, of of protection and management from sort of hard protection in that it's a scheduled monument and designated as such through to the sort of um, softer side of, of dialogue and continual working with the communities really. Forgive me if I missed this, but um, is there any area of working slate or is there any prospect of slates being reopened because they become economically viable? Um, no, um, this was a this was um, a really, really big part of the development of this nomination dealing with the what is often seen as a very tricky issue of, of active quarrying and extraction within World Heritage Sites. Um, it, every, it's quite known that when we originally developed the, the, the nomination, our original thought was to include active and working quarries within the nomination. But we soon realised that this was going to become quite a problematic um, 
problematic thing, both for the nomination and for future future management. And therefore, we, we took the decision that we would have to exclude all active quarrying um, from the World Heritage Site, from the boundaries. Um, in doing this, we also had to trawl through all of the existing mineral planning permissions. So to get a really good understanding and grasp of, of future plans and, and future quarrying. So we, we've safeguarded that as we can in terms of um, excluding all of those areas. So some of our world heritage boundaries, there's a few places where there's little holes, <laughs> holes around it, which are those that might have existing um, mineral planning permissions and where, where quarrying is taking place and obviously again this was done in close collaboration with all of the the quarry owners themselves and good acceptance from local people on on board as communities oh absolutely um brilliant acceptance we we've we've held numerous you know as you do numerous workshops working with the communities and we're also very successful in um during the development of the nomination um obtaining um national heritage lottery funding for a scheme called flecky which enabled us to work with the communities a lot to to um, to work with them and to provide them with with money and resources to do their own interpretation of areas that were was felt important important for them. So artworks were created, conservation was undertaken on a number of sites. We established um, young ambassador schemes and such such forth in in those kind of ways. And our work now again is is working again with the national lottery and also other funders to kind of continue this this work going forward and volunteers no doubt yeah yeah absolutely lots of volunteers obviously um one of the biggest volunteering network in some ways relates to the steam railways so we both got the fastiniog railway and the talitli railway which is a uh, volunteer operated um railways and also volunteers doing for example um Things like um, in Blina Fistiniog, where there's volunteers which which go out and help some of the vegetation encroachment on some of the sites. That's one of the a big issue as well as the vegetation encroachment, and and just um yeah and the young ambassador scheme and and that's something definitely which um we hope to be growing over the future years. Well, thank you very much for that. I think I've captured most of the points coming up in the Q and A. I've paraphrased a few of them, and excuse me to the people who answered them. But I think you've 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 hit on all of those. Um, thank you so much for for joining us today. Huge congratulations, not only for the inscription, but for how far you've come in a very short time post inscription um, on promoting and looking after the site and the message you're able to give to people because it's it, it's hugely impressive. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, everybody else. for, um, And I hope you, you really enjoyed that. We, we are back for our next session at 14.15. We're going a little more, well, bang up to date, really, in, in technology. And we're going to Jodrell Bank Observatory. So I um, hope to join you then. See you in a bit. Welcome back, everybody. Um, and to those who have just joined us for this session, it's hard to tell who's joining and who isn't. The numbers are fairly stable. So I'm going to assume that most people who are here have been here for most of the sessions. We're up to session number four now, and we've really demonstrated so far how our World Heritage Sites encapsulate our island story. We've got everything from Neolithic right up to, to very modern, and we're going to the modern end of the spectrum now. Um, absolutely delighted to be joined by Professor Teresa Anderson, MBE. And uh, Teresa is a physicist and is the driving force behind the inscription of Jodrell Bank Observatory, which is one of our newest and most exciting World Heritage Sites. And again, at the very cutting edge of interpretation and um, uh, engaging people in our World Heritage story. Uh, so Teresa is the director of the Discovery Centre, opened, I believe, in 2011. I'm getting this from Wikipedia, Teresa, so for, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it um, uh, uh, um, welcomes in the region of 190,000 visitors a year uh, and has a really successful schools programme. Uh, I understand it's run as a social enterprise, so the interesting financial model behind that, I'm sure, is not without its challenges. Um, please do add your questions to the Q&A panel if you um if you have any uh, uh forgive me last time i was looking at exactly right the wrong tab so i wasn't picking them all up but i seek to do better this time um uh, and teresa i'm really sorry i know covid didn't hit your inscription but i know it did your celebrations 
So they were rather postponed, um, yes. but yes. hopefully um, something's still in the pipeline. We're having a bit of a rolling party this year. Yes. Well done. All yours. <laughs> thanks very much. Let me just share my screen. Um, thanks very much, everybody. It's great to be with you on this day, um, which is World Day as well as um, Earth Day, as well as uh, our uh, celebration of the World Heritage of the UK. I'm going to talk about Georgia Bank Observatory, um, which is one of the newest, can't, I can no longer say the newest, one of the newest World Heritage sites of the UK. My name is Theresa Anson, and um, unfortunately Wikipedia is incorrect because we've just changed our name <laughs> to the Georgia Bank Centre for Engagement, but you'll see why as I... Um, charged through an, a huge number of slides here. So apologies to everybody if um, that, uh, it seemed a little bit of a whistle-stop tour. It's always easier to say more than less, of course. Um, site was inscribed in 2019 in Baku, just before COVID, we were very fortunate. Um, I have this moment tattooed on my heart when the gavel came down, the chairperson um, in, uh, declared that the resolution was passed and Georgia Bank was inscribed on the World Heritage List. Um, and for those of you who don't know, uh, Georgia Bank is basically a research station. So it is one of the newest and most modern World Heritage sites um, globally. Um, it's also unique in that it is or it was at this point of inscription, the only working observatory in the world to be inscribed on the World Heritage List. So it's a real contribution from the UK to the diversity of the list, which is, you know, something that's perhaps a little hard to do in terms of cultural sites from the Northern Hemisphere. The site has a single owner, which has its complications and its benefits. Um, and the site is quite isolated. It's out in the countryside, surrounded by farmland. It has a strange shape, as you will see, that's the boundary of the site there. And you can see from the scale of the buildings and the pathways, et cetera, that it's actually not very big. So unlike, you know, other sites, like for example, our colleagues at, at the English Lake District, you know, we have a whole different set of, um, you know, issues, but size isn't really one of them. Um, the, the site is a working astronomical site, um, and so that has its, obviously, its own challenges and benefits as well. Um, I'm going to see if this video will run, because it'll give you a feel for it. I think it's running. Can you see that? Yeah. So it's, it's a site that, uh, you know, I would say the buildings are without arch um, architectural merit on their own, but as an ensemble, it's really important. And because of what happened here, it's really important. So we have this very modest architecture and these huge iconic telescopes. These two that you can see, this one that's just looming into view on the left there, um, is uh, and the iconic little telescope, which is what um, the site's known for both grade one listed structures. So it's quite a strange thing that it's got these cutting edge scientific instruments that are also grade one listed. So it's, you know, it's got quite a lot of paradoxical issues for us to deal with, which is absolutely fantastic. Oops, let me just uh, work out how to do that. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. The complications of both Zoom and PowerPoint at the same time. So the site um, itself began almost by accident. So um, it's something that happened post the Second World War, which is, you know, a very recent site in terms of cultural and heritage sites, um, and happened because the person who's really associated with the founding it came back from the war, returned to his research at the School of Physics and Astronomy, started to use some of the radar equipment that he'd been using during the war for other things to look for cosmic rays, found that he couldn't because the trams that were running up and down the road outside caused problems with the reception. And so I was told, well, you can go to these botany testing grounds we have at Jodrell Bank for two weeks. And so he took his army, this is a photo of him and his, his army radar kit at Jodrell Bank in December, 1945, very soon after the end of the Second World War, switching on his equipment, thinking he's gonna be there for a couple of weeks looking for cosmic rays, which he never found. And this is qu quite an interesting thing about the emergence of this new science, because it's very, very serendipitous. It's something that happened quite by accident. And they forgot about him for various reasons. Um, and he stayed and various other people turned up. 
and um, various other bits of equipment arrived. There was a lot of army surplus equipment being thrown down mine shafts at the time. And so, um, you know, he accumulated a lot of it. And the site grew quite organically. It's quite unlike big science projects these days, which are planned in great detail. And, you know, we have people with project management degrees organizing what happens and, you know, huge amounts of budgets and what have you. And at the time, that infrastructure of doing big science didn't really exist. And so this was a sort of very nascent thing where you didn't have somebody in a lab with their own pieces of equipment, but you started to have these big collaborative projects. It looked very ramshackle, as you can see. Um, and the locals used to call it the fairground, and there was uh, sort of some discussion about whether there was actually any um, dodgems or whatever on site, and whether it was all, whether it was serious or not. But this very, very serendipitous Heath Robinson, you know, happenstance way of approaching the science persisted for some time. People's families were co-opted, and eventually they created this thing called the transit telescope. Now it's actually in that picture. It doesn't look like a conventional telescope at all. Um, it's actually a wire mesh. You can probably see there's the hints of a wire mesh dish there. And in fact, um, this is the forerunner of things like the satellite dishes you have on the side of your house, perhaps. Um, a massive dish, 218 feet across, old money at the time. Um, and basically it acted as a huge collector of radio waves, focused the radio waves into a, re a receiver at the centre of the dish um, in, in the way that satellite dish collects radio waves and you know, flex them into your TV receiver and observe the sky as it moved overhead as the Earth turned, which is why it's called transit. It's the transit of the sky overhead. But this piece of equipment, completely unplanned, was responsible for the detection of radio waves from the Andromeda galaxy. Now, that's the first time that radio waves have been detected from an object outside of our own galaxy. So this is actually a momentous point ramshackle though it looks, a momentous point in the science um, of astronomy, in fact, which up to that point depended on, did you have a telescope you could look through? And let's remember, you know, until, until um, Galileo and that period, really people just looked up at the sky and then we have the emergence of the optical telescope, people starting to look at the sky um, through optics, which give you a better view, you can zoom in, you can collect more light and see fainter objects in the 1600s. And beyond that, apart from that development and refinement of that te technique of optical astronomy, there was no other way of gathering data from space. So this is the first step into modern astrophysics where you can collect data from the whole invisible rainbow. I'm not going to do my usual physics 101 lecture at the moment that explains if you see beyond red, you see infrared, if you see beyond violet, you see ultraviolet. And you know, there's actually this invisible rainbow that our eyes can't see, but in fact, radio waves are part of this. Um, and this is the first step into using the invisible rainbow, the bit that we can't see, that we now use all of it in modern astrophysics. Um, and when Lovell was made the world's first professor of radio astronomy in 1951, that was, if you like, the coming of age of this new way of looking at the sky, and it became recognised as proper science. So since that, uh, following that, um, Lovell had this big vision that his transit telescope, which just saw the sky as it turned overhead, would be great if he could point it at things. Um, and so conceived the idea of having this, this big dish you could turn, so the fully steerable radio telescope. And this is the genesis of the Lovell telescope that we have on site today, which is the iconic structure that everybody recognises um, when they think of Jodrell Bank. Had some strange designs to start with, including, as you might imagine, you know, the first mesh dish that they had, they thought they would put that on a tilt, but then the science, you know, developed as they were doing that. Um, and they found that actually the mesh structure wasn't going to be sufficient to look at the smaller wavelengths they were trying to look at. And so eventually the dish became solid. So that meant that even though construction began in 1952, there were design changes as construction was underway, which of course these days you could never do because your project managers and your project people wouldn't let you. But, um, you know, science was the beneficiary of this because, because they could do it. 
um, you know, they managed to create an instrument which is still operational and still at the, at the cutting edge of science today. It was finally completed in 1957 after some budget trials and various, um, you know, challenges that were quite difficult to overcome. But it was rushed into service to track the carrier rocket of Sputnik 1. And um, that was, in a way, its first connection to world events. Um, and following that, it was very involved in tracking a lot of the spaceship that went up both from the USA and the USSR throughout the space race. And um, uh, it feels like a very, um, a very poignant thing to say today, but for a long time, John Bank was a sort of scientific Switzerland, and we had scientists both from the USSR and the USA based on site. And of course, these days, in the current times we're living in, the connection with um, scientists in Russia has actually been severed for the first time since the very early days of the um, the observatory because of the Ukraine crisis. So it's a it's a it's a telling point really in the history of this site. Today we have this iconic structure that I've mentioned. It's a landmark really in the whole of the Northwest. It's something that, you know, it signifies home for a lot of us. If you're coming past on a train or flying over in a, an airplane heading for Manchester airport, you know that, okay, you know, this is a signifier of place. It's something that's held very much in people's hearts. And I remember when I first started working at Jodrell Bank in 2006, it was made very clear to me that while the university might be the legal owner, it was very clear that actually the people own it <laughs> and the people of the region feel that it's very much their site and their telescope. And that gives us a sense of custody really, and the sense of holding this in trust, not for ourselves, but for everybody in the area and for people in the future. So that then takes me to site management, and apologies if I'm charging through this very quickly. Um, we have three main site users. So it's, it's as a comparator with other World Heritage sites, um, you know, I know we have tourism and promotion, but the people who live, if you like, or occupy the site are these three main bodies. The first two are part of the University of Manchester, Judge Bank Centre for Astrophysics, Judge Bank Centre for Engagement, which I, I run. Um, and the third is an intergovernmental organisation, used to be called an international treaty organisation called the SKAO. I'll just come to that in a minute. And in terms of site management, if anybody's had a look at either our um, nomination dossier or our management plan, both of which are on our website, um, you'll see this sort of slightly complex um, architecture for our management of the site, but in fact it isn't. So the site owner is the University of Manchester at the top there, and then the three site users are on the next level. Um, so that's the Judge Bank Centre for Astrophysics, Judge Bank Discovery Centre, now called the Centre for Engagement, and the SKA which is the International Treaty Organization. And prior to inscription, we had a governance group, which we used um, as our mechanism for managing the site together for the benefit of the users and for the benefit of people who might want to come to visit, for how we talk to stakeholders, et cetera. With inscription in mind, we set up our World Heritage Site Steering Committee, which has the same representation as the governance group with, of course, the additional representation from external stakeholders. So whereas they wouldn't be represented on the governance group for the day-to-day -day management of the site, obviously for the World Heritage Site Steering Committee, they're involved in that. So really what's happened with the inscription process is it's brought in these other people who have the sense of ownership of the site into looking at how the, the, the World Heritage Site um, is overseen and the coordinated and the direction of travel for things that are important. So that's been a real benefit really and it's really cemented those relationships with the people in the area or in the nation or you know with um, our colleagues at um, UNESCO UK and World Heritage UK. In terms of the users, just to go into a little bit more detail, the Jodrell Bank Centre for Astrophysics, this is a this is a team photo in 2019, the last one that's been taken, obviously, pre-COVID. 
Um, and it shows about 170 staff and postgraduate students. Now, they don't all have offices at Jodrell Bank Observatory, and um, a lot of them are, um, have, you know, seats and desks, although there's a lot of hot desking these days um, on the University of Manchester's main campus. Um, but a lot of them also work at Jodrell Bank as well. And if you see, there are a huge range of people, not only the scientists, but also the engineers who are responsible for the mechanical and physical fabric of the site, but also things like the electronics, the computing, the radio frequency engineering, etc. So it's very, very complex running an observatory of this um, magnitude. And the scientific research um, is very broad for astronomy, although it's astronomy, which is itself part of physics. Um, within astronomy, this is quite a, a broad range of um, scientists, ranging from what we would call the near um, area of space, which is our own sun, which is only 93 million miles away, out to um, planets orbiting other stars, other suns, star formation, galaxy evolution, all sorts of things like that, right back to cosmology, which looks at the Big Bang itself, which is you know, around 14 billion years ago. And then um, also um, a team who are very, very um, rec well recognized internationally in technology development, which of course you might think with Jodrell Bank, that would be something that's been one of our strengths for many years. So that team is, is um, uh, based both here and um, out in Manchester as well. And the, the, um, the mechanical team, just to sort of look at them very briefly, because you know we know with World Heritage Sites, it's all about the fabric of the site. They do things like they um, upgrade the telescope service. So one of the thing, unique things about our, um, our nomination dossier was it talked about the importance of the ongoing science. And while we retain the fabric of the heritage of the site, we also make changes to the way that works or to the way that's um, looked after in order to prioritize the science as well. So it's quite a balance to be struck. For example, this big telescope you can see there, it's a grade one listed structure, but it's had three surfaces. So, um, it, well, it's had four now actually. So it had three surfaces prior to inscription. And we've just had a, um, the original, for the first time, the original 1957 surface has been replaced you know, in full collaboration and with amazing support and advice from our colleagues at Historic England, of course, it being a grade one listed structure even before inscription, um, to replace that, that very important uh, surface which first tracked Sputnik. Um, and we've, we've actually kept um, 17 big panels from it, just park that in the back of your memory for a bit and I'll come back to it later on. And that's, you can see the new surface at the bottom and the old surface at the top and that's standing inside the original dish. The new dish sits on top of it. Of course, the original bit at the top is rather full of holes and we were worried it's going to land on somebody. So it all had to be replaced, of course. Today, the observatory also has an unseen role, um, which is to be the UK's national radio astronomy facility running this network of telescopes called Emerlin that's spread across the middle of England. Um, and we have a dedicated dark fibre network for that, which brings a huge amount of data into the site every day. Um, and the amount of data is now equivalent to about 20% of all of the UK's internet traffic. So everything that everybody's doing at any time, about 20% of that amount of data is coming into Jodrell Bank every instant. So we, we pack that into our supercomputers, obviously. And that's where we combine those telescopes. So they behave as if they're one big telescope just while we've got this massive dish um, superimposed on the, the surface of England. So those telescopes behave as if they are a big dish. And that allows you to zoom into space um, with a lot more accuracy and pick and zoom into things that are further out across space much more easily. That technique of combining telescopes at a distance, if you want to read our nomination dossier, we talk about this quite a lot, is a technique that we worked on in the very early days uh, alongside colleagues who also did it at Cambridge. And that's now the basis of modern astrophysics. This is the interchange of ideas or one of the many interchanges of ideas you know, that's really important when you think about the, the um, World Heritage Site nomination. And that now also has an international aspect as well because we not only combine our work with the telescopes in the UK, but across Europe. Now, Europe's used quite loosely <laughs> uh, 
as you can see in this instance, because there's actually telescopes across the world that we work with together to create a telescope that's the size of the planet effectively. Um, and those are big collaborations that are still in place today. We always also use telescopes and satellites in space, which um, when we combine them with telescopes on the planet, make it make a combined instrument that's bigger than the planet. So that sort of collaboration, which we talked about in our nomination dossier, is really the lifeblood of the work of the science at the site. Um, and it's also the underpinning for one of the other site users, which is a square, square kilometre array observatory, which is um, a project to create huge arrays of telescopes in Australia and South Africa. So the arrays are being collect, uh, created out in the desert, far away from humanity with our mobile phones and our microwave ovens and you know, our strimmers and all these other things that cause sparks and interference and various other things that disrupt the very delicate signals that these dishes are picking up from space. So there aren't very many people out there in these deserts. Um, and um, these two arrays um, are currently being built and the project has 11 core countries or it did at the last time we looked. And it's, and it was, as I said, it's what used to be called an international treaty organization. It's an intergovernmental organization. It's, uh, and their headquarters is at Jodrell Bank, but effectively is now a diplomatic area. So it's neither part of Jodrell Bank nor the UK, sort of. Um, because it's it's this special place that you know um, enshrines, if you like, the international collaboration that underpins these huge scientific projects. And in contrast to you know the emergence of this science on the site in the mud, alongside this very very high tech, very well planned, extremely well funded international collaboration. You know you have the old and the new. You have the heritage. And the place where this happened and the place where it's still happening today so that's a great thing you know to have this hq at georgia bank we, we had to go through quite a competitive process to win it and being on the tentative list and on the track towards inscription did help us in winning the contract for this so it's a uh, you know, it's a real benefit to show that we had this amazing heritage of the science at the site. Not only did we have that, but that we take it very seriously and we give it the respect um, that you will obviously have to do when you're going for inscription. It's quite a challenging process. And so that was a very helpful thing in, you know, becoming the, the headquarters for this new site. The third beauty of the site is the bit that I run, the Judge Bank Centre for Engagement, and we do what in UNESCO terms is called promotion and tourism and what we call cultural engagement with science and the heritage. Um, we did open in 2011 and, and just prior to COVID, um, welcome to 160,000 visitors per year plus our schools groups. COVID's been a bit of a difficult thing to get through, um, but thankfully we do have ahead of us you know, the fact that we're going to open our new gallery this summer, which is, is going to be absolutely fantastic. Do come, everybody. Um, and so just to talk about a little bit of that work as part of our work for the World Heritage Site, we welcome about 25 to 30,000 school children every day currently to the site. Uh, sorry, <laughs> 150 to 200 children a day, which is about 25 to 30,000 a year. We're going to go up to... Um, 30,000 plus per year with the new gallery. And we've got a highly qualified team, both in science and in heritage, who link what they deliver to the school's curriculum. So that's very important in terms of the scientists of the future and our heritage professionals of the future now um, that we hope to inspire to explore their potential. Um, as Tony mentioned, we do have a social enterprise model, which is, um, you know, uh, it's a mixed blessing. I was very grumpy about it when it when it um, became apparent that that was going to have to be the case to start with. There was no core funding. Um, then I thought it was a great benefit in that, in a sense, you crowdfunded um, and you have to be very close to your visitors and, you know, you have to be very um, connected to them and know how you're engaging with them and exactly what they want to find out about, etc. Then COVID happened and um, basically the university hadn't underwritten us to some extent and it, it wasn't completely. So we did lose 50% of our staff to redundancy during COVID, but the university did support us through that process. Um, and now I am uh, less confident in it 
um, having been battered and bruised by the process, I must say. Um, however, you know, hopefully we are in recovery now and we will move forward with the opening of the new gallery to something more positive, alongside all the rest of us in this sector, to be honest. Um, we do do some wacky things. I say wacky, they're not actually wacky, they're extremely well considered. So we run a music festival. Um, and I have films of this that I generally run into it, where they probably take me over my um, time limits. I won't run them just now. But we have we have about 25,000 to 30,000 people camping on site for a weekend. It's a very long weekend. It seems when we're in the middle of it, um, Thursday to you know Monday morning. Um, but the reason we do it is because we get almost 60% of our people who attend that festival aren't in our core attendees that come on a day trip. So it really extends our reach nationally and now internationally, depending on which acts we are featuring for the music. And at least half of them, and often more than half of them, have never been to visit us before because they would never come to something that they perceive as a science place or a, or a heritage place. And so what we do is we um, attract people with the music and we don't quite lock the gates and don't let them out till they've listened to all the talks but it's something a bit like that you know while they're there we have 65 over the weekend 70 I think this time science heritage and culture talks so in a sense it's like a science and culture festival and a music festival we have lots of exhibitors we have loads of researchers on site from the, our university and from other universities across the UK and it's a real amalgam of things. And this is what we do with cultural engagement with science and heritage. And some people are quite unusual, uh, uncomfortable. Right? I have people saying, but what is it? Is it a cultural festival? Is it a science festival? Is it a music festival? You have to decide. And we don't decide deliberately because actually at that boundary between those things is where you get the dialogue. And for us, even though it's very uncomfortable, and I can tell you, it's quite hard putting it on when you're, you're trying to do it as part of an employee of a university, dealing with people from quite an informal sector, the heritage sector, and people who are used to doing cultural talks who have an expectation of how their speakers would be treated, et cetera. And bridging those gaps isn't without its challenges. And we don't make a huge amount of money from it. So, you know, we don't lose money on it, we don't. Um, but uh, so we don't do it for any of those reasons other than it puts us right on those boundaries. And um, it's a very, very challenging thing to do, but we think it's really important. And I've got a drone shot of the site because effectively you have to build a town. It's not an easy thing to do. You do need project managers, you do need budget holders, you need lots of um, organization because you've got to do power, water, refuse collection, health, and safety, fire management, you've got to have a health centre, you've got to have, you know, emergency services, you've got to have, as well as the music and the science and the everything, camping and stuff. And, you know, one of the things that people always ask me at this point is, oh, what do you do to the World Heritage Site? Well, this, this photo is quite interesting because it's taken from the very north of the site. And the only bit of the World Heritage Site that you can actually see illuminated there is the circle around the telescope. And the dark bit to the top left of that picture is actually where the, world, where the inscribed area of the site lies. And so what we do is we don't actually let anybody tramp all over it. Um, so, so we're very careful about how we manage engagement with it because we have this big iconic structure that you can see from miles away. You can put people in the buffer zone and they feel very connected to it, but you can also protect the site at the same time, which of course is really important. And just to wrap up really, um, I think I'm getting quite close to time. Just to let you know, we have this great new gallery opening later this year, and it's called the First Light Project. It's great. It's a £21 million project. Um, managed to get some funding, £11 million from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. First awarded, I think, in 2014, 15, I think. Um, and this is a great um, way. This is was always in the plan. It always went hand in hand with the inscription process, because we started doing the project in 2008. Uh, this project and the inscription process started, you know, around the same time. And it's about conserving the archive more, working with the university archivists on the archive, setting up some better public management, so better car park, better entrance route, 
a new gallery that engages people solely with the heritage of the, the story of the emergence of the site, some access to the south side of the site, which previously hasn't been granted, it's limited, but it's better than it was, and, you know, exit through the gift shop, because actually the business model is about actually asking people to crowdfund us, give us money, um, so that we can do all of these things. And the project um, is almost complete. I'm very proud to say that the architecture of this gallery building expresses heritage. And so it's aligned with the summer solstice, noon of summer solstice, and it echoes things like Stonehenge, um, the, the amazing Neolithic tombs at Newgrange in Orkney. It's, it's consciously that architecture speaks of the heritage and the diameter of the, the, of the building edge to edge is the same as the diameter of the dish of the Lovell telescope. So we thought very carefully about how this works. It's actually a green hill in the landscape. So it blends into the landscape and doesn't compete with the Lovell telescope as an icon, but it's actually very, very well considered. And I, I think if you remember, I said to you back at the start of this talk, remember those surface panels that we kept, the original fabric of the Lovell telescope, we're using as the substrate, as huge screens inside the exhibition. And on that, and I can use the word palimpsest at this point, we use the surface of the telescope to tell the story of the emergence of the science in the telescope. It's as I was in the gallery yesterday, and we're up just uploading some of the material. It's going to be absolutely stupendous, actually. So I'm very, very pleased and very relieved that it's working because it was my, my idea to do that. So, you know, there's always a bit of a sense of relief when it doesn't go pear-shaped, to be frank. Um, and just to finish, um, the, the only bit of the, the um, gallery which is visible are these lovely curves of the front, um, and it sits in the landscape with the Lovell telescope and echoes it and, and sort of points to it um, and shows it respect as part of um, you know our way of engaging people with what's important about the site. So I'll stop there, a little bit over time, but I'm happy to take questions. No problem at all. That was thank you, Teresa. Really good. And we started the day by talking about how important the stories are behind the World Heritage Sites. Uh, and what a fabulous story, Jodrell Jod Bank. I love the old pictures, you know, of how those ramshackle and very humble beginnings turned into something so important. Uh, it's a great story. Plus you've got the fabric to match it. That's a great picture there. And I, I'm sure it'll inspire many people to come and visit. Um, most World Heritage Sites, as, I think as well, are, are probably about the fabric and then about conservation with research and education tacked on, but you must be one of the unique examples where research and education is one of the key drivers of the site to start with. Um, so it's, a, it, it's an almost unique offer and site and a great addition to the, to the list. Um, so a, a couple of questions, if we, if we may. Um, my colleague, um, Lindsay, has just asked about marketing of the site. How do you, how do, you do that? Do you, just, do you regard yourself as a sort of a mainstream visitor attraction and market in the conventional ways or do you do targeted approaches? We do everything actually so um, uh, and in fact with this new um, gallery that's opening in June um, you know we, we're, we've got quite a complex marketing plan that is partly about um, uh, reaching into specific audiences and partly about you know driving up visitor numbers because we need the income and so there's a there's a really mixed approach you know if you're going to invite people out you have to respect them as human beings and you know if you if you want them to come and visit you you've got to really have the edge on things like you know they've got to go to the supermarket or take the kids to yoga or whatever it is you've got to actually offer them a nice day out and so we're very aware that we need to position our marketing in terms of that and also, you know, we're a serious site that's really, in, uh, you know, involved with pushing back the forefront of research, not only in astrophysics, but also in the cultural engagement with science and with the heritage of science. And so we, we're also aware, you know, that we actually speak to these huge, um, a wide range of audiences, there's a huge, huge multiplicity of people you know, that we talk to and we sort of split it up between us. You know, I have a team that does marketing who are about making sure the family audience come. And then there are others of us who work on, you know, cultural engagement and writing stuff for journals and things like that. So 
it's a bit of a mix really. Uh, in a way, being part of a university is helpful in that because you do have colleagues, you know, for example, for our next festival, I have colleagues who are, you know, who, who run academic departments who are bringing specific people because, you know, it helps them in terms of their research to position people in a, a festival of 25,000 people. So it's, it, 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 we try and look for synergies basically. Mm. Question on the, the, the Q&A um, panel about student involvement in activities in the new centre. No doubt they are and, and volunteers too. Or? Yeah, so that, that's a, um, that's an interesting one because, you know, being a rural site is quite an interesting yeah. um, uh, thing when you're trying to involve students because you don't get the passing trade. So they're not kind of ambling past on the way to the, the coffee shop or whatever or lectures. And so we, we do have to make, have specific initiatives to involve them. The festival is actually very helpful for that um, because we can involve a wide range of people in that and they get a free ticket in return for coming and doing whatever it is for us. But we also have quite a lot of student placements. so. Um, I, I will encourage some students who are on the science side of things to come and have placements doing talks or running sessions or volunteering on stands. And then we'll also get master students from the cultural management MA or whatever coming and having a placement with us where they help us do the marketing or, you know, do speaker management or whatever. So we try and work out exactly, you know, what we can offer. And it's usually quite a wide range of things. Um, and, and I suppose one of the things that's been interesting about COVID is that all of our students went home from Manchester, but a lot of students from elsewhere came back to the area because that's where they lived from other universities. So we ended up having a lot of volunteers from our, not from our own university, but from other universities who lived in the area. So that, that was, you know, real learning point because we hadn't really thought that 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 was there, obviously it is, you know, in hindsight, it's very obvious. So that's kind of widened our engagement really with students. Hmm. And World Heritage Inscription is um, not always compatible with changes that you need to make to fabric and everything. And you are very much a working site. You've, you've um, outlined the offices, the people working there and the cutting edge research and things like having to change the surface of the panels. Uh, um, one would have thought the last thing you wanted was World Heritage inscription and potential um, constraint, but it works hand in hand? It does work hand in hand. And I think, you know, we've had the benefit of the learning from some of the challenges that others have faced, shall we say, both in the UK and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and thankfully, great advice from um, Henry Owen John and people, you know, at Historic England and from people at DCMS about, you know, how to phrase things, how to think about things. A lot of discussion with UNESCO UK and the, and the tentative list panel, because we always felt quite clear that actually if we created conflict, then it wouldn't be to anybody's benefit. And so we had to bring everybody with us. And so, it, you know, it was one of the, it was quite a tortuous process and it took us, it took us a while, you know, to get through the, the panel assessments. Um, and each time we, we were knocked back, because I think we knocked back two, three times, you know, it actually really helped us, you know, painful though it was the day after, it really did help us think about it very, very carefully. And I think, I think it, it has to be the future. You have to think, what is the point? of having world heritage status and it has to be for people and for the planet and if it's for people and the planet for fu the future you have to bring the people with you you know who are who are the site users who are the people who've kept it as it is over the generations or in our, in our case the decades but you know you really do have to build that consensus and think about well it, it, it's not it's not of value in itself completely divorced from humanity and you know on world earth day from our planet we do have to put these things together and and you know i, I i've been reflecting quite a lot on you know the point of building peace in the minds of people especially with the current Ukraine conflict you know and, and what can we contribute and, and really these sites need to be places where people can meet for dialogue and if you can't have dialogue you know it's it's um what's the point really I think yeah and just finally unless anybody jumps on the Q&A um local people you mentioned 
interaction with all smooth any any issues there so most anybody who's done anything with, with their local communities will know that there's a bit of a, a bell curve it's a very scientific thing i'm becoming a physicist again talking about this but statistically you get your bell curve you know some people absolutely love you some people absolutely hate you most people are in the middle and what we try and do is just work with whomever we can um, to address any legitimate concerns my my feeling is that I, um, people are more fed up with us for running a music festival than they are with us for having a World Heritage Site. Um, and one of the things with Jodrell Bank is we've always had planning restrictions around our area because of our need for radio interference quiet. So we, we, you know, we, we've always objected to development in the area since the 1970s when there was a, um, a, planning, a planning direction passed in Parliament. So in a way, the World Heritage Inscription hasn't added anything to that. Um, and as far as people are concerned, you know, it might put a bit of value on, their pr on the price of their houses. So I think, you know, in a sense, yeah. um, the other things that we do have sort of shielded us from any objections. I mean, everyone I've spoken to is very, very positive. We have all, you know, local representative on our steering committee. And yeah, it's generally very good, actually. Excellent. That's interesting about the Planning Act for interference in, yeah. in Bath. We have a Planning Act regarding digging, of course, because of the hot water <laughs> on the grounds. Yeah. We have the Avon Act that says you can't dig that deep, but we, we all have these idiosyncrasies that follow us, yeah. around, but uh, are used to good effect. Yeah, so thank you ever so much, Teresa. A really illuminating um, talk, a absolutely fascinating site and huge amount of, um, of good work's gone in. I love the music festival and admire your, um, your <laughs> bravery in, in doing that. So thank, thank, you. You, thank you ever so much for joining us. We know how, how busy everybody is and we, we deeply yeah. appreciate it. No, very welcome. Thanks very much for the invitation. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Okay, so um, that concludes um, uh, this session um, and we will start again at, what time do we start again? At 15.30 for the final session of day and uh, get your sunglasses on because we're off to Bermuda. I'll see you then. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to what is our concluding session in the Bath World Heritage Day 2022. And uh, I talked previously about our island story and how diverse it was, but we are far wider than that. We, but the um, World Heritage for the UK does, of course, include overseas territories, um, of which Bermuda in, is one. Uh, and we're very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Charlotte Andrews to talk to us today about Bermuda. Uh, Charlotte is a very much valued member of the UK World Heritage family, although she has the privilege of sitting in far sunnier climes than we do. Uh, she has a doctorate in heritage and museum studies from the University of Cambridge and is the head of cultural heritage at the Bermuda National Trust. In that role, she oversees the Trust's island's wide portfolio of historic houses and cemeteries museums and collections, archaeological and heritage research and other cultural heritage programming. Community participation is, of course, uh, a big part of that. And the historic town of St George and related fortifications is the island World Heritage Site. As ever, it's a complex story. And Charlotte is at the forefront of colonial heritage in, in terms of um, um, our World Heritage offer. Uh, and that in alone brings some challenges, but we'll be Interested to hear about them all, Charlotte. Over to you. Well, it's it's hello everyone from Bermuda. It's wonderful to be here with all of you. I, I really want to thank the Bath World Heritage Site and particularly Tony and his colleague Lindsay uh, for the chance to be part of this special celebration on World Heritage Day. I'm honored to speak to heritage that has global significance alongside such esteemed peers, and always grateful for a chance to talk about Bermuda's World Heritage Site the historic town of St. George and related fortifications. As we remain in place over Zoom today, so too is this talk about heritage in place. World heritage is so intangible in its value and meaning, but also embedded in real places and properties. World heritage may be overseen by UNESCO and state parties, but it is wholly grounded and in and shaped by local life. Just as all World Heritage Sites are unique and irreplaceable, so too is this talk Bermuda specific. Our Mid-Atlantic Islands prosperity and stability has little bearing for World Heritage in danger 
and other communities facing harsher realities, some sadly as we speak. I know the people of Ukraine most of all, but also their threatened world heritage sites and other heritage is no doubt in many of our minds and hearts right now. But I hope this partial in view into our local experience of the UNESCO system and local dynamics has relevance for Bath and other World Heritage Sites. So again, I'm really, really pleased and grateful to be here today. Today, I'm gonna to focus on three defining aspects of the Bermuda World Heritage Site and its management. First, inscription, which lays out the outstanding universal value or OUV, which I know we've been talking a lot about today, um, and other values ascribed to or derived from the site. Secondly, I'll look at infrastructure, and the key management mechanisms that enable Bermuda to meet world heritage obligations. Thirdly, I'll look at implementation to explore management as a process and our responsibilities for more community-driven approaches. Throughout these aspects, I'm gonna try and intertwine some heritage theory, including critical work about the UNESCO system amid the 50th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention this year. Um, I'll also be bringing in the wider Bermuda and UK context, especially the island's cultural and nonprofit sectors, as, world, as well as World Heritage UK, which is how I know Tony so well, um, who, who as Tony might have said already, has produced the first independent review of UK World Heritage sites and found central challenges um, common to most of them, um, including St. George's. I'll also be reflecting a little bit on my own positioning as a Bermudian involved with World Heritage for 20 years now um, in a variety of roles and now as head of cultural heritage here at Bermuda National Trust. But I wanna stress that we are just one of many partner members in our World Heritage site and its management committee. So onto inscription. Um, UNESCO inscribed St. George's and its forts in 2000 so we recently marked our 20th anniversary, uh, just a few years after the major 400th anniversary celebrations of the 1609 wreck of the Sea Venture, which led to the settlement of the town and island in 1612. This is my daughter's interpretation of that, by the way. St. George's core value is being an outstanding example of a continuously occupied, fortified, colonial town dating from the early 17th century and the oldest English town in the new world. Having met the criterion four as a quote, type of building, architectural or technological ensemble or landscape, which illustrates significant stages in human history. And I'm sorry everyone about the birds, they're um, starlings and they're, you might hear them a bit in the background. I've been banging on the walls to move them away. Historic houses, you know. Um, so the site, the World Heritage Site, is located at Bermuda's East End and spans much of St. George's Parish, which you see here. It covers about a quarter of Bermuda's 21 square miles. It's home to about 6,000 people or 9% of our population, with higher numbers identifying as Bermudian and Black than these national averages. The culture and community of the East End is both unto itself and an essential part of local life and identity, which Bermuda's new national cultural heritage policy captures quite well. So to read that to you, quote, our identity as Bermudians is connected to the wider world through the roots of European explorers, enslaved people of African and Amerindian descent, mainland Portuguese and Azorian peoples, political and trade connections with British and American interests, and familial and historical connections with the Caribbean. This identity continues to change and develop as a result of more recent arrivals of people from the Philippines and other Asian countries. We recently drafted the site's attributes for the first time. Attributes are the tangible and intangible elements of the property that express or enhance the outstanding universal value. They should be based on our statement of OUV, but it was important for us to expand beyond its Eurocentric and white colonial limitations. The many attributes we drafted all fall under three headline components. 
The first is the intact and continuously occupied town with its historic landscape, vernacular architecture and living community. The second was the related fortifications and military heritage, including the forts themselves, their artillery and historic garrison community. And then there's the maritime heritage in terms of Atlantic influence, marine environment and living maritime traditions. So a national settlement story, a wealth of surviving built heritage and recorded or in situ archeology, span uh, meaning known or unknown archeology span and a distinctive character all contribute to the OUV. Yet St. George's is far from being a frozen story, outdoor museum, designed landscape or single ticket attraction. Across 400 years and 2,500 acres, the inscribed site and buffer zone is a densely populated mix of residential, business, tourism, and cultural uses that change over time. This recalls Mary Catherine's gardens thinking about heritage sites as heritage scapes. It draws attention to their qualities as dynamic, fluid, changing spaces with which people regularly interact. And I know this is very much the case for Bath and some of the other sites we've heard from today too. Oops, sorry. Related forts and related military heritage are, are also in, integral to our inscription in OUV. And though maritime heritage is not explicit in our statement of, of OUV, there's a wealth of heritage uses related to the port town and harbor, the East End as a hub of maritimity and their intersections with all Bermudian re relationships with the sea. And I explored this for my doctoral thesis. So um, yeah, again, maritime heritage is huge in Bermuda and particularly in the East End and World Heritage Site. St. George's joins 1100 World Heritage Sites worldwide. Um, and as Tony's already said today, there's, there's 33 others in the UK collection uh, as World Heritage UK shows here. Reminding how sought after World Heritage designation is and how selective UNESCO has become in awarding it um, extra congratulations to the, the, the newly inscribed sites. Um, but it also, um, you know, we see there are several other sites still seeking inscription. I just wanted to note that Turks and Caicos, which is seeking inscription, is tied to Bermuda's salt trade and St. Helen, Helen, Helena, where Boer war prisoners were held um, as they were here. So just to stress that there are, there are links between the existing and potential sites. I'm sure there are many others too. But as for the OTs, um, there are four of them in the overseas territories of the UK. Uh, World Heritage UK's uh, review that they did recently only ended up focusing on the mainland sites, although its president, Chris Blanford, did extensively visit, visit us for his assessment. And I, I loved spending time with him here and I hope he'll come back and, and other members of you, World Heritage UK will come soon too. Of the overseas territory sites, St. George's and Gorham's Cave in Gibraltar are cultural inscriptions, whereas Gao and Inaccessible Islands and Henderson Island are natural inscriptions. But beyond them all being on islands, St. George's has little in common with these entirely archeological or uninhabited sites. We're a much more akin to historic townscapes like Bath. So again, it's great to be with you all today. Um, as well as sites like Edinburgh um, and Liverpool, which is now sadly delisted, but again, still really important heritage relationships there. Uh, so we fit into UNESCO's World Heritage Cities program as well. Um, and um, the town is a member of the Organization of World Heritage Cities, which is a different group, um, and that's represented by, by the town's mayor. Um, but Bermuda is not a UNESCO small island developing state. Um, but it is part of the Caribbean Action Plan for World Heritage, and it, that does link with the SIDS program. We also learn much from, from complex landscapes, excuse me, complex landscapes like Glenhaven, industrial landscape, and Neolithic Orkney, which I know we've talked about a bit today, too. So um, in terms of value, we see critiques in the mainstream media by activist networks like Our World Heritage and by heritage scholars like Lynn Mescal who are raising questions about UNESCO's mission drift, list making and effectiveness that may well bear out at the local management level. 
But national pride around culture, including our OUV, comes with a desire to maximize the cultural, social, and economic value that we as a host community can derive as the primary stakeholders and beneficiaries of world heritage status. That was noted by um, scholars Matthias Ripp and Dennis Rodwell. So again, just really stressing the local benefits of world heritage um, besides the, the global significance. That um, cultural value or social value can shape identity, community, and soft power that, that can come from, re from meeting UNESCO standards. Social value advances UN sustainable development goals with health and well being, quality education, reduced inequalities, and sustainable cities and communities being highly re relevant to the Bermuda World Heritage Site. And then economic value is about leveraging financial return from and creating viable business models for culture. So again, sorry, I, I, uh, the first one was cultural value, social value, economic value. Now moving on to the infrastructure of the site. In terms of our obligation, such, such value comes with the heavy responsibility to constantly protect our OUV for humanity. Because the state party who has ratified the World Heritage Convention and the local government differ in our case, the UK state party depends on Bermuda as, self, as a self-governing territory to manage and fund the site. It perhaps goes without saying that our inscription um, and Bermuda's responsibilities would remain if Bermuda were, would to, were to go independent. And just to add, St. George's is Bermuda's only World Heritage site so far. But there are others that um, could prove worthy of uh, inscription in future. And just to speak to those, we have the African diaspora, which is intrinsic and vital to Bermuda's people, history, culture, and identity, and tied to UNESCO's slave route. African diaspora heritage trail sites span the island, with several inside the World Heritage Site. Our remarkable shipwrecks and other underwater cultural heritage whether in situ, as an archeological record in collections, or as other heritage uses, would join the 50 marine world heritage sites if, if they were to be inscribed. Should additional Bermuda sites besides St. George's be inscribed, a well-integrated local world heritage management system would help to protect their individual OUVs and to reap bigger benefits for Bermuda. Both UNESCO and the UK State Party require the sites they oversee to have adequate management plans or systems in place. And these are expected to be reviewed every five years and annually reported on. Again, I, we, we've talked about this a bit today. Scholars have distinguished between World Heritage man Management plans and systems though, and I have argued that both are needed, ideally from inscription. So I just wanna stress this idea of like, it's not a plan sitting on the shelf. It's a system that you can constantly track and through that have a lot more community participation. So that's really the ideal that I hope we'll be striving for. Uh, the government re recently led the third review of our management plan, uh, which we aim to be comprehensive and holistic, aspirational but realistic and participatory and process oriented. Basically we aim to create both a plan and a system. The management plan review was undertaken in collaboration with the site steering group, and the steering group reflects a mix of government, nonprofit, and private owners, that some of whom you see here, the government departments or quangos and several other cultural organizations. So uh, as you were, as was noted earlier, no one, um, no one does this work in isolation, and that's extremely true for our site, where there are just so many different partners with different resources, um, and that's before you even get to the wider stakeholders who, who you know, can and should be involved in the management. Um, but you know, that steering group is only an advisory body to government and its departments can be subject to ministerial discretion. Um, but despite that, such a mixed public partnership can unite resources and different kinds of expertise, like I was saying. It can lead to more robust um, debate and in the end, better management. So our steering group's really a rare model in, in actually our local nonprofit and cultural sectors. Um, we often see organizations kind of working at cross purposes or in their silos. And so it's, it's amazing that the World Heritage Site has the potential or in reality brings people together like this. 
But just as the World Heritage Convention is, is dependent on the signatories um, to uphold their obligations, you know, our plan depends on partner accountability too. And it's, it's difficult sometimes because you don't have binding mechanisms. I mean, the World Heritage Convention struggles with that too, right? So without that, you have partners who understandably pursue their own strategic and fundraising goals. We have to do that here at the Trust, you know? Um, but sometimes that can run counter to the implementation of this, this wider holistic collaborative plan. Um, one example of that is, um, this is the World Heritage Center in St. George's, which I used to have the privilege of, of overseeing. Um, and this was opened in 2009 after a multi-million dollar campaign. It was restored. They converted it into the World Heritage Center with exhibits and all sorts of facilities. Um, it was a great event space. But, you know, all the partners never really bought into that. And sadly, today, it's now closed and it's going to be reused. There's talk about it becoming something something else. Um, uh, it was just in the paper recently. They're looking at it becoming a brewery. And I dare say that could be a great way to connect people with heritage. Um, but the point remains, you know, you, you, you pour in money to something like this. And that's not lost. The building's still there. But, um, but we no longer have our World Heritage Center. So maybe we'll have one combined with with uh, brewing, but um, still, it's uh, it's. I think it's a it's a cautionary tale for moving forward. Um, and also about alignment, you know, um, the UK State Party, UNESCO, and its cultural advisor ICOMOS, they're concerned with our World Heritage Site and its management plan, right? But our government and steering group, we have to balance that with. Um, our, our, our national objectives too, and the various plans that we're dealing with locally. So you see some of those here. So it's, again, how do you dovetail that all together and also meet your UNESCO obligations? And so of the infrastructure for Bermuda World Heritage, I'd say capacity is the most critical. Um, World Heritage UK stated that the limited resources and skill-based at most of the World Heritage Sites is constraining the unlocking of their great potential. Um, thus, there's a need for that increased capacity, resources, and diversification of skills. And, and so, and I'd say that's very much the case here in Bermuda. We have a lot of fantastic cultural professionals, but we just, you know, when I hear about the size of some of the other teams, um, I'm always struck by, you know, how, you know the infrastructure at, at some of the other UK sites. Um, yeah, we just need more dedicated capacity. Um, and it's not just about heritage expertise, it's about soft skills to deliver a complex plan while you embrace wider stakeholders. Um, but above all, it needs focused attention. World Heritage is a very specific type, type of heritage practice, and especially to meet those operational guidelines that um, UNESCO and ICMOS stress. So I know your stakeholders are here today and they just wanna sort of hear about the sites, but I think I think it's important that, that the wider public understand what our obligations are um, and that it can be difficult to, to reach those whilst satisfying the needs of your local constituents. Um, and of course, there's always a need for funding um, and that really applies here. We've all been through so much, you know, in our respective, um, respective uh, places. Um, and I will say, I just appreciate so much how much World Heritage UK has been advocating on, you know, on behalf of all of the UK World Heritage sites. But for us as an overseas territory, we're often left out of the government funding, like the Cultural Recovery Fund. Not, we were ineligible for that. Um, and so, and also, as we, pro as people may know, you know, UNESCO has a fund, but when you're stretching it across 1,100 sites and sites in much greater need, it's really a non-starter. Um, so yes, funding is funding's a tricky one. We've been reimagining our um, sort of third sector here and hope, hopefully that will help us to, to gain more local funding. Um, and of course, having UNESCO status, it opens us up to international grants. So that's just wonderful. Um, uh, but, but really the, we have a small amount of funding and it's largely used on kind of infrastructure projects for the town of St. George's. There's very little for sort of wider world heritage management. So I think what we're trying to develop is, is more sustained support year over year for our World Heritage Site. Now on to implementation. Um, 
Yeah, besides where we are, despite where we are, there's been a huge amount achieved over the past 20 years uh, by the partners here in the wider community. Um, we have robust planning protections and conservation of built heritage. Um, we have architectural, archeological, historical, anthropological, and other research that's happened. And then there's the interpretation, the education and other cultural content and programming. And then of course, tourism is key to Bermuda's economy. So the cultural tourism of the World Heritage Site has long provided huge economic and social value to Bermuda. After all, a lot of our identity centers on being a tourism destination. So it's, it's a cultural value too. So as we move forward, we can try and retroactively capture some of those this value. And I, I get really excited about things like cultural mapping, where we could we could kind of, you know, even if it's looking back, but literally track where we are going forward, see how it's not just the heritage partners or managers who create that value, but it's the wider public in their personal and neighborhood and other relationships with the site. Um, so I love that idea of tracking it. And then we can link that with the goals we have for the site. And even those those worldwide sustainable development goals, you know, and um, you know we're very very aware of sort of uh, linking with climate change in particular and also social justice, which I'm going to speak more to. Um, but as my my PhD supervisor Mary Louise Sorensen, we went to a World Heritage Conference at I Iron Bridge many years ago together, and there she made a point about we really have to think about what we mean by terms like sustainable development. What is what is really sustainable locally and globally? And I think that's more under the microscope now than ever. Um, and another friend, my friend Susan uh, Kaitemetze from Botswana, he stressed that heritage needs to be relevant to everyone, to people's everyday lives and their social needs. Um, so our World Heritage Site and indeed our cultural sector, we really have a pivotal role to play in addressing Bermuda's biggest problems, which include entrenched inequities and negative environmental impacts. We must try to connect our people and resources in greatest need with the pro process of protecting our outstanding universal value. Um, but, but benefiting the East End and the wider Bermuda community and protecting our OUV for all of humanity, it's a delicate balance. As UNESCO and ICOMO stress, positive impacts don't offset harmful impacts, right? Um, Dominic Walker, a heritage scholar, he ex expresses this, this sort of uh, universal local values divide and saying, despite UNESCO's increasing recognition of social values, the claim of universality may be a force for exclusion when heritage management practice ignores the dynamic nature and need of local communities. And I'm not saying we're doing that, but I just think it's, it's an important thing to consider sort of local versus universal. Um, just to just to highlight sort of some of this divide, you know, there was a daytime shooting in, in 2021 in central St. George's, and it reflects the gang violence happening across Bermuda that primarily impacts Bermuda's black majority community and its young men. Gang activity at town gardens, surrounding forts and other inscribed sites is a management problem without easy solutions, particularly as gang intervention requires risk assessment and specialized skills. Other concerns in St. George's include homelessness, which itself has two sides and needing to respond to the complex needs of homeless people and the negative impacts on the town. So fulfilling conservation and other management plan objectives through the upskilling of incarcerated Bermudians from prisons that are actually within the, buff within the site itself in the buffer zone of it, that could like double the impact. It's the impact we need um, but it's also a very aspirational idea that's full of real hurdles. So nonetheless, we need to stay problem focused and develop a management plan as a roadmap for social change. At least I, I feel that, I hope that. Um, and I think that'll keep our sort of local values more intact with our living world heritage site and it will help maintain and enhance our OUV. In the same way that addressing problems in the East End, um, it addresses problems for all of Bermuda a focus on local needs, it, I think it can better meet those UN sustainable development goals um, and other sort of global agendas. So there's been, since we were inscribed 20 years ago, there's been enormous shifts in, in, in cultural management, heritage management and community participation or engagement, which again, I know we've discussed a lot today, 
it's really been the biggest shift in heritage and museum practice. Um, and it relates to that big theoretical shift. Uh, and I love the work of Laura Jane Smith, where she treats heritage as a process or a verb. Um, it's always something in the present. It's always something people do. Um, and here we have something from UNESCO stating that the, the recent policy and conceptual developments in world heritage, they set the stage for new approaches that engage indigenous and local communities in world heritage. The inclusion of communities as one of the five strategic objectives in the World Heritage Convention reflects an increasing demand for community engagement at all stages of the World Heritage process. I just mentioned this one program up by For All. I'm not a member of it yet, but I was really inspired by them because they're, they're really trying to connect with communities in, in, in local authentic ways. And, and just in terms of like, and you could apply it to the World Heritage Site where we're not just doing it for people. We're not just cutting ribbons for them and saying, oh, look at what we've done. Instead, actually it's the heritage process of managing the site, of interpreting it, that that comes from community. Um, it, it really reflects the community. Um, it's just a different paradigm than sometimes we operate from when we're the heritage managers. So that desire to participate is, is really important when, when we, have, um, we have to meet these World Heritage Standards, when we don't have the capacity um, and other infrastructure, and when we face these sort of unanticipated threats to the outstanding universal value. So we have to be really proactive about things like neglect of historic buildings and monuments, um, development that impacts the site and its setting. I know UNESCO is increasingly concerned about, about impacts to setting. Um, risk to archeological sites and collections. The, the, the site you see here is pretty much all an archeological site. I was actually in the square you see yesterday, King Square with um, archeologists who were using ground penetrating radar to try and identify what was under the, under the surface without having to dig. And they were finding all sorts of cool features. So, you know, everyone thinks of the town as, as what you see here, but there's, there's a whole, there's, there's 400 years of an evolving town, both beneath and then above in the architecture and other, other um, cultural elements. Um, and then of course, there's the threats of, of climate change and our need to really prepare well for that. Um, and this, the square you see again here has flooded in the past. The, um, I'm not showing them to you now, um, but there are um, projections that this much of this area could be flooded in future um, or, be, or gone, frankly, because of um, uh, higher sea levels. And then that you just have the impacts of it being a tourism site and a living town. Um, so just to stress that there's a lot of threats we're kind of you know, having to work against and work together against. Um, and Tony, how am I for time? Because I wanted to talk a bit about interpretation, but I am aware that I've been going for a while. Fine, Charlotte, you're fine, you carry on. Okay, just give me a thumbs down if we're getting too tight or something. Absolutely. Um, but to talk about interpret, I'd like to focus on interpretation in terms of the implementation of the plan, because I think it's a really critical opportunity to involve more of the Bermuda community in our world heritage. Um, it's, we're, St. George's is a colonial town steeped in colonial expansion, the practice of enslavement, or the system, I should say, of enslavement, military might, and close-knit chasms. Um, so it constantly evokes, and for some, for many, triggers the ongoing power relations of the Atlantic world, uh, the African diaspora, and, and indeed modern Bermuda. The story of St. George's and decolonizing that story it can happen through this sort of continuous interpretive planning that it's, it is embedded into the management plan and system. There's a need for sort of radical reinterpretation and it's, it's really been thrown into stark relief uh, and urgent relief by the worldwide Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, local anti-racism and social justice movements They've been really energized by this, but they, these have been going on for decades here um, since desegregation was achieved in Bermuda just over 60 years ago. And indeed, well before it, um, emancipation here was in 1834. So there's been a long, long history of activism going back to the actual days of enslavement. So we're in a time where statues are being removed from their powerful plinths misappropriated objects are just are being discovered, demanded, and sometimes increasingly repatriated. And as our cultural institutions decolonize their collections and content and diversify their teams and partnerships, 
heritage professionals are exploring and embedding these seismic and necessary shifts into our, our heritage representation and practice. So just there's a great deal to do on that front here in Bermuda. And the first crucial level of this reinterpretation is representation of opening up the stories told while unpacking the central narratives and the tropes or the kind of motifs that we use to reinforce them. Again, Laura Jane Smith, she recently spoke to the politics of recognition saying how one is represented or not is integral to power. Brent For Dr. Brent Fortenberry, who does a lot of work in Bermuda, he's also argued the need for more, quote, equitable and inclusive narratives set within a framework of heritage justice instead of histories that celebrate white colonial achievement. And he's argued this specifically for the Bermuda World Heritage Site. So in an earlier such effort I was involved in, we reinterpreted signage for different St. George's sites. We tried to open up the narrative from a narrow monumental or kind of tangible heritage uh, and white male perspective to include the wider social history of enslaved and free blacks, as well as women and children. However, what we failed to do was open up the interpretive process itself. And this gets back to this idea of a heritage process. We didn't really get into it in terms of who was telling the story and the ways it was told. Again, I had a real hand in crafting this signage and then we put it up and it's almost that ta-da moment. Here you go, we've improved your site for you, not with you. And so there was no disruption to interpretive power that I hold and, and an opportunity for others to feel ownership over the story was missed. And indeed, is it my story to tell? Involving younger people in interpretation or other heritage processes is especially important for emerging identities that can create a lifelong sense of belonging. And to be sure, we there are so many community curators here. They're not waiting for invitations to be allowed in to do this work. They're doing it anyways. You know, they're creating their they're curating and creating their own heritage and stories, um, and they're and they're making livelihoods from them. Uh, we see that also our tourism authority has been investing in African world heritage tours being created and led by black entrepreneurs. So that's really indicative of, you know, of this opening up of who tells the stories. So it's reclaiming the stories and the right to tell them. It's really, really important to heritage and identity and indeed the living world heritage site. So uh, Dominic Walker, who I mentioned earlier, he writes about, he writes, Quote, collaboration is ultimately about decentering authority and accommodating the diversity of values that exist in democracies. It's also about acknowledging social injustice. Um, so we had a cultural stakeholders conference here last year and someone said, it's really about collecting the complete picture. So like the traditional museum, our roles have to evolve. Um, and it makes me think of like sacred museum collections. I remember when I was at Cambridge that you know, they, they have a focus that only source communities can, can handle certain collections. And so again, there, there may be stories and spaces that are for some and not for others in this time where we're trying to kind of find more balance. Um, our role as heritage managers and curators, it now involves creating collaborative frameworks and safe spaces for stories to be heard and to perhaps heal some of the generational and personal trauma. And if it can be crafted for kind of exchange and debate um, and sort of allowing, they call it dissonant heritage when people disagree. But if you can create spaces where people can come and bring their different views to the fore, then you can help repair some of the deep fractures. Certainly we have those deep fractures here in Bermuda that divide us as a community. So the hope is it's about using heritage to build mutual trust. Um, and I'd say that almost needs to happen across all the world heritage relationships, because I'm talking locally, but it goes all the way up to the state party, to UNESCO, to ICOMIS. I think there's, there's, there's the need to build trust along all of that. But particularly when we work in our own communities and we have these sort of um, authorized roles, I'm, I'm finding on my own journey is that you need to be really self-reflective on what you're doing. What are your blind spots? What are your biases? Um, and you might not even realize that you're sanitizing, appropriating, or invalidating people's world heritage and other heritage. So, so I guess I'm, I'm challenging myself. I mean, even me speaking here today sort of helps, but it's, it's pushing beyond token gestures to take action. It's knowing when a space is not your space 
it's resisting the, the urge to sort of indulge um, your own white fragility and other things. So this is the kind of anti-racist work that, that we have to be reaching for in Bermuda, particularly um, those of us um, uh, in the sector who come from certain backgrounds. So, so it's a lot, you know, it's what we need to do if we're committed to redefining the power relations of making and managing heritage. So finally, to conclude, um, I presented a range of local management issues and views under these banners of inscription, infrastructure, and interpretation. And I know that's a bit been a bit academic, but I really, again, think it's really important for, for everyone to understand what is involved in, in managing World Heritage Sites. And there is a best practice that we are aspiring to. But most of all, I hope your takeaway, and I, I actually got this from Chris Blanford, um, president of World Heritage UK. He, he really said, stressed to me, the, the central message of the World Heritage concept, that World Heritage is so exceptional, its value transcends national boundaries, and it belongs to current and future generations. Um, and in the case of St. George's, I think it's precisely because our outstanding universal value is local, living and in place that it's significant to all of humanity. Um, so I hope that gives you all a sense of the complexity and richness of, of our World Heritage Site and its management on the ground. And we hope you have the opportunity to visit Bermuda and our World Heritage Site. Thank you all for listening and having me. Thank you, Charlotte. We wish we could visit, but um, thank you ever so much for the presentation. You've done exactly and bought exactly what we hoped you would bring which is a, a very different take on things, not um, just because of the geographical status, but because you've come at it um, from an angle of addressing social issues through World Heritage Management, which is something that we haven't heard really from other sites. Our focus tends to be on preserving the OUV, the fabric, telling stories and things like that. So it's a very different aspect and, and really welcome one. Um, thank you. In, in terms of that the decolonization of history, that's something that um, mostly all of our urban sites are sort of struggling with, certainly in the UK. Um, I get the feeling that, that in the UK, it's something that the, those of us in management feel that we ought to be doing rather than having a groundswell of opinion from people knocking on our doors telling us that we should do it. Is that a different case in, in Bermuda? Are you getting citizen um, reaction we, we heard from Amy very first thing this morning that, that visitors had expressed that they felt uncomfortable in, in the buildings and things. Do you get any sense of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I just in our, our local landscape, again, you have to remember that we're a black majority community, sure. but that in a way shouldn't matter. This is our history. This is everyone's in history. And you can, particularly in terms of um, reinterpreting sites of enslavement, which we're working on as a national trust with the National Trust Organization right now, it's a responsibility, I believe. And, um, and I think it, my own personal journey in sort of anti-racism work is, is, you know, it's a time to be uncomfortable. It's a time to grow and change. This mm -hmm. is the only way that you can, these things can be healed in a way, I think it's a, you have to go through the process. And this is the, this is sort of the recognition of the heritage process as well. And I had actually a friend I've made in, in, the, um, in the, the personal work I've been trying to do. And he said, I sort of said, oh, I wanna sort of get through this. And we, and people often say that, you know, you hear people saying, get over it. You had to hear people sort of wanting to push through it. But he, what he really stressed was, you need to be in it. You need to be in the process. You're going to make mistakes but don't shy away from that because that's where the growth happens. That's where the mutual trust happens. That's where the fractures that we see in our societies maybe can be healed. And I, you know, he's local, he's from Bermuda, but it, it just, it was so resonant as I think as a person, but also as a heritage professional, that this is what heritage is about. It's about letting things sit, but you don't, you're not just trying to get through it to keep one narrative. It's about opening it up. It's about allowing debate. It's, mm. a, you know, it, it's so, yeah, it's not easy. And, yeah, so. but it, I believe it's something we have to face. And really, I think that there's such rewards, personal rewards out of that, but collectively in terms of our identity and how, how our community connects or how the, the social issues that they plague some people more than others because of the inequities, but they affect us all. So um, yeah, I think heritage is extremely powerful. And I, I see this sort of work as a responsibility, but 
how quickly and, and well we do it depends on us as a sector. And I think mm. so maybe uncomfortable is good. We embrace embrace the uncomfortable. It's a process we need to go through. We got a question from Keris Humphreys on the um, on the Q and A. Uh, I'll read it out to you. It, um, it, is there strong support in Bermuda for the CARICOM reparations movement? And could greater acceptance by former colonial powers of some of the points in their 10 point plan contribute to mitigating some of the issues you've spoken about, both societal and in terms of funding? Is that something you are happy to comment on? I mean, I'm not a representative of the Bermuda government. I'm a, I'm a local nonprofit. So I don't know if I think, com and I, I, really interesting to hear about that. And that's the kind of thing I should know more about. Um, but I will say that, you know, reparations are certainly, even in my personal relationships, it, it's an issue that comes up a lot. And I think there's the question of what do reparations look like? And then how does that apply to, to heritage specifically um, in terms of creating new opportunities or um, addressing inequities that, that, that still exist because the legacies of the past continue? So um, I can't speak to that that um, those that reparations scheme specifically, but I really appreciate hearing about it. And I think, you know, I think I think things will continue to move in that direction until. But I think I think heritage management in itself can be a form of reparations if we're if we're shifting the paradigm. And you know, it's it's of course there's monetary reparations are the major reparations people talk about, but it's also dismantling certain systems and ways of thinking you know, acknowledging our biases, creating space for others and opportunities that maybe haven't been there. Um, and again, in our case, it's a black majority. People talk of minorities, but in our case, it's it's flipped around. But the inequities are very much with the majority of the community too. So mm. um, sorry not to answer that one. No, that's fine. Thank you. And thank you, Charlotte, so much for joining us and for your contribution today. I know there's a time difference. You're four hours behind, I believe, or something, but it's uh, it, it, it really is much appreciated for you giving up your time and, and preparing today. I'm going to, um, we, we're running um, close to time. I'm going to draw us to a close. Um, so I, I would like to thank all of our speakers today for their excellent contributions. I know you're all very busy people and we appreciate the support that you've given us in, in World Heritage Day. Um, thanks too to our own learning and participation manager, Lindsay. Um, who put a lot of the day together and to Helen Daniels. Uh, Jan at um, Nomad IT, thank you to you too. The, the, the proof of the pudding is that we haven't heard much from Jan, so he's done his job and um, facilitated this excellently. But the big thank you goes to everybody for joining today. Uh, it's really, really important that, um, that we run these days together. It's very easy in places like Bath, if you live and work there, just to become a little bit blasé and take this for granted. But it's such a very, very important site. And as Charlotte has said, it's important to all of humanity. And it's important that we realize that and all these engagements help towards the conservation of these fantastic sites. Um, we will make a recording of today available. So please watch out for our social media links um, for details of how to access that. And so you can please tell your friends and family and enjoy it afterwards. But beyond that, thanks to all involved again um, have a very good weekend and we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Goodbye.